Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host for today, John DeLynn. It's August 25th, 2022, and we are super excited to be continuing our series on examining Mormon church truth claims with LDS discussions. Uh, today, the topic is going to be changes to the Doctrine and Covenants with LDS discussions. For those of you who don't have a Mormon background, uh, the Mormons can the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints considers four main scriptures to be kind of part of their canon: the Holy Bible, which is the Old Testament, and the New Testament, uh, the the Book of Mormon, and then there's something called the Doctrine and Covenants, and then something called the Pearly Great Price. So the Doctrine and Covenants is basically Joseph Smith's revelations while he was a prophet, with a couple other things added on at the end. Um, and and obviously, uh, since Joseph Smith was our founding prophet coming to understand uh, the revelations that he gave, the way that they were shared with members, and then if and when they were changed or altered over time uh, is an important way to understand his role or power or authority um, as a prophet or not. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I just want to remind everyone that all of these episodes that we're doing as part of the LDS Discussion series can be found at ldsdiscussions.com. It's an amazing uh, resource with, with a wealth of information. We also want you to know that for this series of audio and video episodes, we have released all of these episodes in audio and video format on Anchor, but they're also available on Spotify, and you can even watch them video-wise on Spotify. And they're also available on... Um, YouTube. There's a playlist under the Mormon Stories podcast channel where you can watch all these episodes in sequence. And of course, you can watch them, listen to them on uh, Spotify and on Apple Podcasts and hopefully wherever you, however you consume um, your podcasts. So uh, now it's time to bring on our amazing uh, <laughs> guest uh, for this series. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Welcome back. Thanks. I think we're going to, I'm I'm going to at some point, if I haven't already set the record for a person that's been on your show the most, right? Yeah, you're going to set it for sure. All right. No one, I'm going to be like the, like the Cal Ripken Iron Man streak. No <laughs> one's breaking this record ever, hopefully. <laughs> well, that won't disappoint me unless there's someone better who can, you know, but I don't know, better, better is the right word, but unless there's It'll somebody be else better, that's yeah. got compelling com content at w yeah. and as prolific <laughs> as you, they've got to be have as, as compelling of content and be as prolific when that will be hard to beat, but we'll see. I'll put that on my gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've done a bunch of episodes so far for those of you who haven't checked out uh, the previous episodes with LDS discussions. We've covered Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, treasure digging, history, Bible stuff, and all of it kind of builds. So we really do recommend that you not just start with this episode. You're welcome to, but we really do feel like these episodes intentionally build on each other. So having said that, let's jump into today's episode, Mike. All right, let's do it. Um, the, the episode for today is at LDSdiscussions.com. And the, the URL is in the show notes. It's basically changes dash two dash revelations, but the focus is on the Doctrine and Covenants. So. Yeah. And and this is going to work really well. As John said, if you haven't listened to last week's episode on the priesthood restoration, I would recommend that because this is going to almost continue straight from the end of that with regards to talking about how Joseph had to go back and change revelations to kind of adjust to the needs that he had at different times um, when he was running the church. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And that was, I try to stay as neutral as I can, but that one got me emotionally riled up. <laughs> that was upsetting to me. So yeah, that one's, anyway. I, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at all the episodes and the essays on the website, you know, there's certain ones I think that are obviously more impactful and more important than others with regards to like truth claims versus is the church, you know, doing good things or bad things or true or not true or whatever. I think the priesthood one is really important because it's so central to everything yeah. that happens in the church. And so that episode to me, when I was listening to all the podcasts before I started doing the essays, the priesthood restoration to me was one that was just shocking. Cause it's like, Holy cow, as a convert, I was taught all these things. And then you find out it's not at all how it happened. And then you find out a lot of people know that and still teach it anyways. And so, um, that's a really important episode. It's a really difficult episode, yeah. but it also is a great segue into this episode, which is kind of talking about, how Joseph Smith changed the revelations from God um, as needed in many instances that are very important. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I gave a brief introduction to what the Doctrine and Covenants is, but let's have you do the real job. Yeah. And so we talked about this uh, in previous weeks. And basically in 1833, the church collected all of the revelations that Joseph Smith had claimed to have up until that point. They put it together in a book that is known as the Book of Commandments. And what happened was they're doing the printing of this and there were mobs that were going into Missouri at this point and they destroyed the printing press um, as they were printing these books up. And there's the story about, um, is it Mary Elizabeth Leitner Rollins Smith, I think, um, I believe who was in the field and she was protecting um, the manuscript pages. And because she did that, they were able to keep some of the revelations and make some of the books. And long story short, there's only a few hundred copies of these that are bound together. Um, most of the church membership would not have it. I believe at this point they were in well into the thousands. And so in 1835, Joseph Smith undertakes this again and creates a book that includes all the revelations from Joseph Smith, as well as the lectures on faith, um, which I think um, were mostly written by Sidney Rigdon, some were jo by Joseph Smith. And so the, the doctrine is the lectures on faith, um, the covenants are the revelations. And effectively, when they're doing this in 1835, Joseph and Oliver are going through all of the revelations and editing them before they put them into what is now known as the Doctrine and Covenants. And because of that, there are a lot of changes we can track between the Book of Commandments and the Doctrine and Covenants. And it's really important to look at what has changed against how the church frames those changes. Got it. Okay. Um, and and if people want to read the Book of Commandments, the 1833 Book of Commandments, they're, they're digital copies, right? There are, and the Joseph Smith Papers Project has most of the original revelations on their website, and you can see kind of the handwriting, handwritten original um, revelations, which is really helpful too, because they also do give historical um, source notes and stuff. And so I know a lot of people would, you know, if you're not a believer, you might kind of cringe at that, but they, they do a really good job of, you know, giving accurate dates. There are instances where they'll kind of in their introductory notes give some comments that'll kind of give you pause as a believer because it's, it's conceding a lot of things uh, that would have been called anti-Mormon lies. And um, I, I highly recommend that if you want I recommend looking at their website, you could search, like go on to Google, you know, say, for example, we're going to go over DNC seven later. If you search for like DNC seven original revelation, it'll be one of the first ones and you can see the handwriting. They'll give you a bunch of source notes. It's actually pretty cool. And, and that is a good way to track that against, you could just obviously then look up DNC seven and your scriptures are online and compare the two. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guess, I guess it's worth just noting that I guess this discussion implies a certain expectation for how, you know, the, the Mormon church teaches its members that God communicates with prophets. And I'll just say it really briefly that, you know, from, from, kindergarten, you know, from primary, you know, nursery to Sunday school to seminary, even in the missionary discussions, it's usually pretty straightforward. It's basically, you know, one of the, probably the very first missionary discussion is just like in ancient days when God spoke to Noah or God spoke to Abraham or God spoke to Moses, you know, God communicated with them and then they wrote down what they heard from God. And a lot of people believe that that ended with, uh, you know, with the Holy Bible, but the real value proposition of the Mormon church and the restoration is that God, once again, starting in 1820, God is speaking with man again. And uh, even though there was an apostasy where the church fell out of, you know, God's blessing from like, you know, Jesus's death until 1830, Joseph brings back God's one true church and he brings back prophets to the earth. And so basically God speaks to Joseph, Joseph writes it down and we, we know God's will. And so there is a level of sort of accuracy or consistency that I think Mormons gain, uh, you know, credibly or, or with good, you know, with good reason, right? It's, you know, because we're going to be talking about changes that were made to revelations and maybe if there's a period out of place or a comma or like a spelling, but, but what we wouldn't expect would be fundamental changes to a revelation once it's received. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and you well, are a convert. Like, so you might, you can maybe say, you can share from your perspective. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, going through the missionary discussions, it was told that basically what you said is the commandments from God ended when the church fell into apostasy 
and it was restored through Joseph Smith. And I think one of the things that's interesting about it is when I think about the missionary discussions, then it was described not just as Joseph Smith getting revelations, but that all of the prophets through then. So Gordon B. Hinckley at the time would be getting revelations from God um, about the latter days. And, and the whole selling point of the church with regard to revelations, at least to me as a convert, was that not only did Joseph Smith restore the church, but that we were getting constant revelation to guide us through these these last days or the latter days, whatever you want to call it. And I think one of the things that for me was an early thing that I noticed but didn't really put too much weight into was why does the DNC end with like, what, 100 years ago or whatever? I think there hasn't been a canonized revelation in like 100 years. So um, you would expect, to your point, um, to have more consistency within revelation. But more importantly, these are being described as revelations from God directly to the prophets, which would then beg the question of why are they being changed Beyond grammatical, to your point, you're going to have changes in style of language between 1830s and 1840s and today. You can understand that. It's when you're changing the fundamental content and the purposes and all that of the revelations, it really does make you go, why in the world are these being changed? And as we talked about last week, if Joseph Smith feels that he's okay changing them in in substantial ways, then all of a sudden, how do you trust the rest of it? Because all of a sudden, you can see he's more than willing to take the words that are supposed to be directly from God and alter them in ways that tend to benefit his current theology and current needs. Yeah. Okay. So anything else on this, uh, on this first slide? No, this one's just pretty much just setting up the fact that there's, there's two versions and um, it leads to this next quote. And we talked about David Whitmer a lot. Oh, last can week. I, can I would... clarify? There's more than two versions, right? Because even after the 1835 yeah. version, yep. there's been many instances after that. But do I, yeah, there's are more we changes. Be... And yeah, we'll get to that a little bit. Because okay, there's okay. obviously some that get pulled out. And Yeah, okay. And, yeah, yeah, and so time. we talked last week about David Whitmer. He was one of the three witnesses, obviously very involved in the production of the Book of Mormon, very involved in the production of the early church and all of the early... Um, ideas that Joseph Smith was bringing forth. And so this is from um, his, an address to all believers in Christ, um, which he printed up near the end of his life, kind of talking about what his thoughts were on Joseph Smith and the church. And so he says, some of the revelations as they are now in the book of doctrine and covenants have been changed and added to some of the changes being of the greatest importance as the meaning is entirely changed on some very important matters as if the Lord had changed his mind a few years after he gave the revelations and after having commanded his servants, as they claim, to print them in the book of commandments. And after giving his servants a revelation, being a preface until his book of commandments, which says, Behold, this is mine authority and the authority of my servants and my preface unto the book of commandments, which I have given them to publish unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. Also in this, he says, Behold, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me. Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful. The revelations were printed in the book of commandments correctly. This I know and will prove to you. These revelations were arranged for publication by brothers Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Orson Hyde, and others in Hiram, Ohio, while I was there, were sent to independence to be published and were printed just exactly as they were arranged by brother Joseph and the others. And when the book of commandments was printed, Joseph and the church received it as being printed correctly. This I know. In the winter of 1834, they saw that some of the revelations in the book of commandments had to be changed because the heads of the church had gone too far and had done things in which they had already gone ahead of some of the former revelations. So the book of doctrine and covenants was printed in 1835 and some of the revelations changed and added to. Okay. So he's just saying what we're going to show in this episode, which is that they print these revelations in 1833 And then all of a sudden, Joseph Smith realizes that he's contradicting them in what he's teaching out, you know, after 1833. And so in order to fix that, you have to retrofit that back into your history. And in this case, not only are you changing your history, as we talked about with, like, say, the first vision, you're actually altering what are claimed to be the words of God. And in many of these revelations would have been taken directly off the rock in a hat. He received his early revelations in the exact same manner he translated the Book of Mormon, which is he would put his peep slash sheer stone in a hat, put his head in the hat, read the words to a scribe. So these revelations would be very much under that tight translation. And so to go back and change the words of God either gives you that either or choice. And I'm sure a lot of people say it's not black and white, but either God changed his mind, as David Whitmer said, or the people who are making the changes are making it up. And I guess you could have a third option, which is that the words were correct the first time and then Joseph changed them. So I guess you have three options, but 
it really does give you pause when you see one of the three witnesses who caught it at the time wondering why they're making these changes. And he flat out says it's because they got out ahead of them and had to backfit the story in order to be consistent. So um, I, there's a couple things that really stood out to me in this quote. One is that, again, one of the three witnesses is saying, man, what's going on? These things really have been changed between 1833 and 1835, and they've been changed to totally alter their meaning and the, you know that's the, there's a problem there. So so that's a really important admission. And then the thing is, he seems I'm trying to understand his explanation of why they had to be changed. Whether he's saying I'm upset at these changes, or whether he's just saying, well, maybe some of the heads of the church went too far, and now we've got to correct it. But it's almost like a bit of an apologetic answer instead of saying, hey, something's wrong here. He's basically saying yeah, we went too far and now we're correcting them, but but he's not really seeming to imply something nefarious or deceive you, de, you know, deceptive. I don't know. I feel like it's pretty sharp in the way he's saying it. I think he's saying basically, I, I mean, to me, it reads almost like he's saying, you know, the, the start of the church was true. Then Joseph Smith was almost like a fallen prophet and fell into bad ideas and therefore got out ahead of the original. Like, I think, okay, okay. I think he believes in the original revelations. I think he believes in the Book of Mormon, but I think he, he, in his mind, Joseph Smith then becomes a fallen prophet, starts doing things. We talked last week about how he mentioned how the priesthood is, was completely retrofitted and was not necessary in the early days, which makes you wonder why it would have been um, necessary, uh, you know, later. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, so I, to me, I think it's a sharp way of him saying that he fell away um, without maybe being a little bit more yeah. antagonistic. I, I don't know. Okay, no, I, that's good. I feel like it's pretty sharp. Okay, yeah. And I'll just say this. This is something I like to do. I did this uh, la la last time when we talked about um, – uh, when we talked about the priesthood, like given the narrative that we've already basically established, which is that we, there seems to be this pattern of there being, you know, no, you know, no, no evidence of certain some important things happening. And then all of a sudden some really bold claims, but then those claims changing over time as Joseph's beliefs and, and, and associations evolve, yep. um, if we were to sort of say, what would we expect to have happened with the Doctrine and Covenants in the Book of Commandments, given that pattern, I can just say right now, I just want to say this up front, what we would expect to happen is the earlier versions of the Doctrine and Covenants would reflect Joseph's earlier beliefs or his earlier positions or his earlier associations, and then over time, they would change and then have to be kind of either edited or deleted or replaced to sort of stay up with his evolving beliefs and his evolving associations with other people. I think that's what we would expect, knowing nothing about the actual data. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's just it. And, and and this is this is basically David Whitmer saying, "Hey, that's what happened right off the gate." <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny too because when I first started doing the deep dive, I would often get a response from people that would say something along the lines of, "You're looking for all these problems. None of the early church members had a problem with it, and he would would have been doing it right in front of them." And at the time, I'm like, "Oh yeah, but but you do see that there are people mentioning it." I mean. You have David Whitmer here. I think William Law brings up uh, that. Um, oh, yeah. McClellan brings it up. I mean, so there are people in the early church who are leaving and saying he is just making stuff up now. And the truth is, a lot of people at the time did see it. And a lot of the people that didn't see it, you know, we just don't know. But the fact is, it was being noted then. And now we have a lot more hindsight, a lot more data, a lot more um, documentary uh, evidence to go against. And it's pretty clear. He's changing the words of God. Now, if you we'll get to the apologetics at the end, but the fact is, this is this is not a, a matter of opinion. This is a matter of yeah. very tangible facts and very tangible um, documents that we can show he's changing. And yeah. there's just no way around that. All right. Well, let's jump in. Let's jump yep. into the data. Yeah. And so one of the things I want to go through first, because we're, we're going to go into the um, actual revelations in a second, but this is what some of the church leaders have said about some of the changes he made. So Apostle Legrand Richard said in a 1978 interview, as far as I know, there have been no changes at all in any of the revelations. If there ever, if there have been any changes, it would, excuse me, have all been fixing grammar or something like that. So he's saying 
No major, no major changes. Okay. Jo- Joseph Fielding Smith, um, who we know hit the 1832 first vision when he saw it, said, Inspiration is discovered in the fact that each part, as it was revealed, dovetailed perfectly with what had come before. There was no need for eliminating, changing, or adjusting any part to make it fit, but each new revelation on doctrine and priesthood fitted in its place perfectly to complete the whole structure as it had been prepared by the master builder. We covered last week that is just not the case because he was making changes constantly um, that absolutely contradicted all of the earlier revelations. Um, And then Apostle John Widso said, within a few years after its organization, the church had received practically all necessary supplementary laws and regulations. These also have remained unchanged. There has been no tampering with God's word. The whole body of church laws forms a harmonious unit, which does not anywhere contradict itself, nor has it been found necessary to alter any part of it. And so, and that's these, three. That's three apostles really laying down the gauntlet. Yeah, and and it's. I mean, it's clear. And this is this is the company line. And I don't want to um, sound like I'm being disrespectful, but this is the same thing here with the Book of Mormon. There's lots of changes. It's all grammatical. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. And, and it's just not true. Yeah. And in the Book of Mormon, we talked earlier about some of the more substantial changes with the first vision and Joseph's view on the Godhead. I would argue with the Revelation, it's a lot more obvious. It's a lot more clear. And it's a lot more detailed because we have the source material to compare. Whereas with the Book of Mormon, um, we could show where he changed from 1830 to 1837 but we obviously don't have the source material of the gold plate. So it makes it a little trickier. This one, we can show a really good way of looking at his linear changes in theology and how he yeah. retrofits them back in. So these, these quotes are just, and we, I don't know if they knew better. Um, I know well, Joseph we'll, Fielding we'll, Smith probably did, but yeah. I mean, we we'll, we'll see whether those words are true or not based on the evidence you lay out. But yeah, I mean, basically last episode already establishes that, but I just want to note to, non-Mormons or Mormons, that these are these are apostles or ordained as prophets, seers, and revelators. Yep. So when they deceive or lie or are ignorant, like best case, if if they if these statements turn out to be false, best case they were ignorant, which is a problem if you're a prophet, seer, and revelator and special witness of Christ. But worst case, they're being outright deceptive. But let's just see if they're right or wrong, because we haven't even established that totally yeah. yet. There's a second set of quotes, right? Yeah, so just two more quotes on this because I want to try to really make clear this is how the church has taught it. So this is a Mormon writer, John Stewart, from um, Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, published in 1966. He says, several of his associates sitting in his presence when some of the revelations were received reported that Joseph would dictate them to a clerk at as fast and steady a pace as the clerk was able to write, maintaining an even flow of delivery and never altering the word spoken. Which again, that is a tight translation. It also matches what we know about the revelation. So that is a true quote outside of the fact that we're going to show they were changed. And then Apostle Hugh Brown said, none of the early revelations of the church have been revised. And the Doctrine and Covenants stands as printed, including sections five and seven. Those, these two sections and some others are addressed directly to certain individuals, but there are lessons in them for all of us. And therefore they have not been deleted. And I just want you to remember that quote because we're going to go back to that one at the end, because DNC seven in particular is a really, he's being dishonest 100% in that, in that quote, he is lying. So, um, yeah, I will just, I know lying is a strong word. He's lying. It's just very dishonest. So let's let's get to the evidence. So let's start with DNC five. Here's DNC five, which is what, uh, Hugh Brown said was not changed. And, um, so in the book of commandments, um, Joseph Smith, has the original revelation. And this is a revelation from March of 1829, which is as he's getting ready to translate the Book of Mormon. And Joseph is told by God, and he has a gift to translate the book, the Book of Mormon. And I have commanded him that he shall pretend to no other gift, for I will grant him no other gift. So what he's saying is, Joseph Smith's going to have the power to translate the Book of Mormon and nothing else. That's from God. Um, and David Whitmer confirms this in his all um, address to all believers in Christ. And he says, after the translation of the Book of Mormon was finished, early in the spring of 1830, before April 6th, Joseph gave the stone to Oliver Cowdery and told me as well as the rest that he was through with it, and he did not use the stone anymore. He said he was through the work that God had given him the gift to perform, except to preach the gospel. He told us that we would all have to depend on the Holy Ghost hereafter to be guided into truth and obtain the will of the Lord. 
So David Whitmer is confirming what this revelation was stating, which is that once Joseph Smith translates the Book of Mormon, he will have no more power from God, and he should not pretend to have that. Interesting, so, interesting. Yep. Uh, I mean, I, a couple things come into my mind. One, one, I know that that he ends up trying to translate uh, the Book of Abraham, among other things, the Egyptian papyrus and the scroll in the cave that we'll talk about. So that's a little weird. The other thing I'm just thinking of is it must have been a huge pain in the rear for him to be doing the stone in the hat thing and hiding it and sticking his head in the hat, especially if it was all made up anyway. And so I could see him wanting to shed the stone in the hat and just say that I'm getting this just directly from God. Um, I don't know that we, I guess when we covered the episode on Joseph's folk magic, when he was doing some of that Book of Mormon translation, People didn't, you know, people around him didn't believe you could just like get revelation directly from God. You had to have a magic object. Right. Like, like, uh, like a stone, you know, we talked about like magic mirrors or Jupiter talisman. Yep. So I, I can see why he needed to claim that he had a magic object because of the superstitions around him, but I could also see why he would want to get rid of it. Um, the, the one thing that is I'm looking at this. I'm trying to think about this idea that no other gift like that, that seems really global and extreme. He goes on to become prophet, seer, revelator, mayor, chief cook, bottle washer, like head of the Legion. Like it seems like he ends up saying his, his leadership and, and powers and abilities have no bound. Eventually he's like crowned as king of the world. Right. But, but I'm also hearing apologists say, now, come on, you're taking a word out of context. You know, it, you're you're being you're being too extreme and literal with what he's saying. You know. Well, uh, I would go to the next slide then because I think to be fair, there's there's no real. I don't think there's a good apologetic way to get around this. Okay, because all right. He's, Let's see. Yeah, it. so he's going to change this now and the doctrine and covenants. So remember, it said um, you will pretend to have no other gift. Now he changes it to say, and you have a gift to translate the plates, and this is the first gift that I have bestowed upon you. First gift. And I have commanded that you shall pretend to no other gift until my purpose is fulfilled in this, for I will grant you oh. no other gift until it is finished. Oh. So here, Joseph Smith is changing the revelation to say that in the original revelation, God was saying, oh, I'm going to give you more stuff to do, but not until the book is finished. If you read DNC 5, the original, in no possible way is there room for that. None. Okay, is it Book of Commandments 5 versus DNC 5? It is... Um, Book of Commandments is chapter four. It's DNC five currently. So when, okay, so did this change between Book of Commandments and the first DNC? They, when they did the DNC, um, they have, uh, I think they might order it a little differently and I think they might have oh, added okay. some stuff in and so the order just changes. So there's, uh, I, okay. I tried I to put try I to see. put the side by side or, okay. you know, the, so the notes. most people obviously are gonna look at the DNC, but. So in that visual right now, the yellow sentence is the sentence that was added in the 1835 DNC uh, added to what was previously in the Book of Commandments. Well, okay, four. so on the slide you're on right now, you're on the Book of Commandments. I'm just putting it in yellow because that's where I want people to, I think that's yeah. the point of emphasis is what's changing. And so um, so if you go to the next slide, that's the Book of Commandments. And now if you go to the next slide, and that's going to be the one we just talked about where he's now, uh, go back one more. Okay, so yeah. this is where he is going to change it. And this is because he needs to address when he's doing the 1835 one, why he is doing all of these other things. Why is he still getting revelations? Why is he doing the book of Abraham? Why did he do the um, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible? All of those things are happening before 18 or around this time. I think the book of Abraham is right around this time. I'm not positive if it's right before, right after, but he is obviously still translating. He's still giving revelations. He's still doing everything. He's leading the church. He's altering the priesthood, altering the first vision, all of these things. And, and that's why, you know, again, from David Whitmer, he says, as if God had commanded Joseph to pretend to no other gift, but to translate the Book of Mormon, that he would grant him no other gift, in quotes. And then afterwards, God had changed his mind and concluded to grant him another gift. God does not change and work in this manner, which you'll hear the church say all the time. God's never does not change. The way the revelation has been changed, 22 words being added to it, it would appear that God has broken his word after giving his word in plainness, commanding Brother Joseph to pretend to no other gift, but to translate the Book of Mormon. And then the Lord had changed and concluded to grant Joseph the gift of a seer to the church. So that's really, were, that's really super damning. Yeah. He's stating the obvious because he's saying Joseph Smith made clear that he can pretend to no other gift. So either Joseph Smith is breaking the commandment by pretending to get revelations, pretending to do these other translations, or 
God's like, you know what? You did such a great job. I'm going to change my mind. And I'm just saying, if this was another church and you had this, you'd look at this and you go, oh yeah, this person's making it up because this idea that God is just that, you know, flip floppy with something as important as the restoration of his church is nonsensical. And you got to remember these revelations, this revelation here would have been off of the rock in a hat. This is not something that Joseph's just winging. This is something that he is at least pretending or claiming to read off of a rock word for word yeah. from God, not translated from reformed Egyptian directly from God. So how is it changing in such a monumental way? And, you know, well, like I said, we'll get back to it at the end, but you know, we have an apostle of the church telling us this revelation wasn't changed. I want to ask you if you're watching this, was this, or was this not changed? Because if it was changed, that apostle is outright lying. And that apostle would know that this yeah. is changed because they would have had access to all of this. So yeah, this is, this is a big change. Does it, is it a smoking gun? Well, kind of, because it shows Joseph Smith is willing to deceive. I don't think it's as bad as the book of Abraham, but it does show you yeah. Joseph is willing to lie about the words of God in order to give himself an yeah. elevated status in the church. And he does that. And what's damning about this to me is that, number one, David Whitmer is one of the three witnesses and one of the early founders of the church to the Book of Mormon. So you can't discredit him. He writes it in a book called an address to all believers in Christ. We should probably do an episode just on that pamphlet at some point. It'd be a fun one, because yeah. Because it's really important. But but here we've got the words and the and the exact change and we've got yep. we've even got David Whitmer complaining about the change specifically yep. saying that as an eyewitness Joseph gave up the rock, said he wouldn't do it anymore, then he changes the revelation and he keeps doing it. That yep. is a slam dunk. Period. Yep. And it that's yeah, I mean, it's just, it. this is a change that you can't, you, like I said earlier, this is not a matter of opinion. This is, you can see it for yourself. And I've said so many times in these episodes, I've said a lot like on Twitter and stuff, it, a lot of people will come back and they'll say, you just have to have faith. You have to have faith. It'll all work out. And I just want to point out again, faith is not, faith is the belief in what you can see. Faith is, or I'm sorry, let me start that over. Faith is the belief in things you can't see and you can't know. It is not belief in spite of what you can look at with your own eyes and read yeah. and understand. And this is to have faith that that God meant this when he when it was written down differently, I think goes from faith to something altogether yeah. different because we can see that we can track the differences and see where Joseph Smith is making these changes that just happened to benefit Joseph Smith. Yeah, it's toxic faith if it denies reality, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're willing to throw out evidence, you're no longer doing faith. That's that's something all, altogether different because yeah. you can see it. You're just choosing to ignore it. So yeah. um, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to bash people who make that argument. Yep. I'm just saying the argument itself is bad. So all right, um, let's look at yeah, the DNC so, visually. DNC yeah, just go to the next. We could just spend a second on this. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, this is just the Tanners put these together. Um, and big shout out to them for doing this because it's just a good way if you're watching this to look at this. And if you go to um, LDS discussion, if you're not watching, I have it on there as well. And you can see all of the areas where Joseph is changing it, and you can get an idea of how expansive these revelations can be um, when he gets to 1835. And while they do show there are some grammatical changes, some wording changes, they also are showing you there's some huge ones as well. Yeah, that that visual is stunning, and it's super damning. Yeah, and I don't. I I just would love to hear Patrick Mason or Richard Bushman or Terrell Givens defend this. Yeah, you know. I mean, I think, well, like I said, I think Richard Bushman, and we talked about last week, and I think he's in the apologetic section as well, just basically says, Joseph did want to be constrained by the revelations and felt he was authorized yeah. to change him as he saw fit. And I just, I think that's a terrible yeah. apologetic because again, that, that, that to me makes it indistinguishable from fraud when you're claiming to have the words of God and then also claiming that you can change them whenever you need to, to suit later needs just does not make sense because why can't we do that today? You know, I mean, like, right. why can't we? Uh, say that, you know, the word of wisdom I feel is uh, not what God wants for me. So I'm going to go out and get yeah. smashed tonight. And yep. I'm being facetious a little bit, but I'm just saying, once you start changing them, once you allow that and you say there's that authority, where do you stop? Because that, the whole point is that the word of God is supposed to be unchanging and, you know, non-negotiable. Yeah. And here we are. So, and what's, you know, honestly, <laughs> You know, we showed those five quotes. I think four of them for Mormon apostles. We've already, we've already disproved. We've already shown them to be wrong or deceitful in their statements. Yep. Certainly misleading. Um, whether it's intentional or not, we can't know their hearts. 
but we've got like 20 more slides. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're just getting started here. I mean, that's, right. and I, that's the first we've already, one. So, we've already proven them to be either ignorant or, or dishonest. We've already, yeah, I mean, we've already I, shown I think it. in those particular quotes, they're being intentionally yeah. dishonest because yeah. they're, they, and you got to remember too, and, and I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but at, at this point, when they're making these quotes in the 60s and the 70s, people can't hop on Google and search original yeah. DNC5. And so I think, you were, you're not going to hear, although you do hear some apostles make those claims a little bit now, for the most part, it, it's it's a lot more carefully worded because this is something you cannot say didn't happen because we have we have the documentation. There's no way around it. And um, and so, yeah, I think at the time they thought, as my uh, as the person close to me said about changing stories back in the old days, you used to be able to get away with that before Google. Now you can't. And so, um, yeah, I, obviously they're, they're showing themselves to be lying yeah. for the Lord in this case. All right, let's go to the next one. Yep. So this is D, this is what is now DNC 18. And um, in June of 1829, Joseph claimed a revelation through the stone regarding the formation of the church. And the, por- the part of the original revelation is from chapter 15 of the book of commandments. And it says, behold, I give you a commandment that you rely upon the things which are written for in them are all things written concerning my church, my gospel and my rock. Wherefore, if you shall build up my church and my gospel, my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And the, the, the words here that are important is the, the phrase in them. So he says, for in them, all things are written because the, in them is supposed to be the gold plates. Cause remember he's translating the book of Mormon. He pretend he's allowed to have no other gift to pretend to. So when God says for in them, all things are written concerning my church, my gospel, my rock, he's saying in the gold plates of the book of Mormon, that is something we've talked about in previous episodes, which is that the book of Mormon obviously contains almost none of the unique Mormon doctrines. Um, and so obviously after the book of Mormon, everything that is kind of uniquely Mormon is really still going to be evolved. And so Joseph Smith, after he starts doing all these new things, when you talk about the priesthood restoration, um, baptisms for the dead, um, this idea of the endowment, which I know the temple is a while away, but they're, you know, they're building the Kirtland temple and all that. And he, you know, they're getting ready to build it. So Joseph Smith realizes that a lot of what he's going to be doing and what he is doing is not in the book of Mormon. And so he needs to change that in order to ad- ad- adjust for the fact that it's not all in the gold plates. Okay. Um, so let's see how it gets it gets changed. Yep. So the next slide, um, he's going to need to reconcile it. So he says, behold, I give you a commandment that you rely, rely upon the things which are written, for in them all thing, are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, my rock. Wherefore, if you shall build up my church upon the foundation of of my gospel, my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And so David Whitmer says, these changes were made by the leaders of the church who had drifted into error and spiritual blindness through the influence of Sidney Rigdon. We talked last week, he really does not like Sidney Rigdon. Um, Brother Joseph was led on and on into receiving revelations every year to establish offices and doctrines, which are not even mentioned in the teachings of Christ in the written word. Um, In a few years, they had gone way ahead of the written word so that they had to change these revelations and you will understand when I have finished, he's talking about all of the, the writing. And so, so will you, um, will you, will you kind of rephrase first of all, what the change was? So in the first one, uh, it's behold, I give you a commandment that you reply upon all things which are written for in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church. So what he's doing is he's trying to say later. So, okay. So if you look at the previous one, it'll say, Here's the I previous kind of, one. I should have, the yellow should be a little bit longer. So it says, for in them all are all things written concerning my church, my gospel, my, my rock. And so if you go to the next one, okay. he's going to add in the phrase concerning the foundation of my church, which is to say that now what he's saying is the gold plates have what's needed to found the church, to create the foundation. But and then, then I can build point, upon it. Yeah. And then that point he can build upon it. So it says if you shall build up, up my church upon the foundation of my gospel, my rock. So it's a small change. And again, this, this one, I don't think is as, is as impactful as the last one, but he's making that little phrase to avoid the problem that the, the gold plates do not have any of the uniquely Mormon stuff you'll have after 1830. Um, and by changing that to saying it gives you what you need to get started. Yeah. And that gives Joseph freedom to add to it later. Okay. And, and so a couple things here, I think now you, you read what what Sidney Rigdon wrote about why, or sorry, you wrote you you read what David Whitmer wrote about his concern, and I'll just kind of read it again. He's basically saying the church had it right when they started, but then they drifted into error and spiritual blindness. 
um, through the influence of Sidney Rigdon, Brother Joseph was led on into receiving revelations and to establish offices and doctrines that are not even mentioned originally. And I, so I'm going to just say two things that I see going on here. And you tell me if you see it is right. Number one is, you know, Joseph, Joseph Smith puts his stake in the ground with the Book of Mormon and with the Book of Commandments. And even his 1832 account of the first vision, he's putting these stakes in the ground doctrinally, theologically, and with his own history. But then, like as he meets Sidney Rigdon and Sidney Rigdon starts to influence him, Sidney Rigdon starts taking Joseph's doctrine and theology in ways that David Whitmer maybe doesn't like or doesn't agree with. And so the, the 1835 version is reflecting Sidney Rigdon and other people's influence, but it's changing. And David Whitmer's saying, I don't like these changes. And by the way, it's unethical to be changing God's word. That's not how God works. And so the church wants it both ways. They want us to believe David Whitmer is one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon because he's essential. But then when David Whitmer's saying the church is basically going into apostasy and overriding the doctrines, um, the, the church doesn't want us to even know that he did that, let alone believe that his objections have credibility, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think you can see, we talked last week about his dislike towards Sidney Rigdon. And I think there was a lot of infighting because you think about David Whitmer and Martin Harris, um, Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith are the original four, you know, the three witnesses and Joseph Smith. And all of a sudden Sidney Rigdon came in and was elevated in that church so quickly and became the number two. So I think there is a lot of people uh, who were foundational to the church who kind of got pushed aside a bit by Sidney Rigdon. And then all of a sudden you see Joseph Smith incorporating Sidney Rigdon's ideas. And I think that would make you pretty upset. And I think you see that in this response where he constantly refers to the fact that when Sidney Rigdon came, Joseph Smith started putting in these bad ideas. So I think you have, you, you're right in the fact that he's noticing that he's changing a lot of things that he said to these original witnesses, original members of the church were foundational yeah. and non-changing. And then you also see what you believe to be a really bad influence who may have brought him down. I honestly think that Joseph Smith, while he did take some of Sidney Rigdon's ideas on the priesthood, um, you know, I think he also truly believed what he was doing was from him. I don't think he was implementing polygamy because of Sidney Rigdon. I don't think he was implementing, you know, the temple ceremony. Uh, the book of Abraham, I don't think was a big Sidney Rigdon thing. So you have all these things he's doing on his own. I think Joseph Smith, um, whether he believed that he was doing something from God or whether he just, you know, sometimes people start to believe in themselves when you, when you fake it enough. Right. And um, so I, you know, I don't know, but I do feel like David Whitmer here does have a real big ax to grind with Sidney Rigdon, which of course we need to be aware of. But at the same time, in the last week's preset restoration, we showed you why he has that ax to grind and why that does track historically, even if David Whitmer seems overly angry at Sidney Rigdon in, in over like in an overall sense. Yeah. And certainly Sidney Rigdon was only one of the influences of Joseph Smith. And it's normal yeah. in any corporation, let's just say, for leaders to emerge, founders to emerge, and then some to fall out of graces and then yeah. new new influencers to come in. So it's not particularly pernicious that Joseph had people come and go in his life. The other thing is Joseph Smith was certainly a sponge whether it was learning from the three degrees of glory from Emmanuel Swedenberg or getting the temple ceremony from the Masonic Lodge or yep. the, as we'll talk about in the word of wisdom from the temperance societies or whatever, he was kind of a sponge. And I think everybody admits that what's inconvenient about that is as your theology evolves, you're kind of stuck with the writings that you published. Yep. And so he needs to get people used to um, in those early years, just allowing him to like literally delete or edit or change or move on and not be held accountable. Like you said, Richard Bushman felt, I just want to say one other quick thing that I'm observing. Tell me if you agree with this. When Joseph first starts the church, even in 1829 and 1830, you get the sense that he's kind of said to his colleagues, Hey, listen, I know this is a lot of power, but I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to let the power go to my head. I'm going to, you know, God's going to constrict what I can do. And we're all going to be kind of team, team, you know, team members here. And we're going to be leading this together. And it, it's not going to be all about me. You almost get the sense that that's kind of the vibe God or Joseph is trying to give off in those early years. But then kind of like the Lord of the Rings or the ring, 
the power seems to get to him and he seems to be uncomfortable ever being put in a box. And so even though he promises that his power is going to be constrained, you just see him growing and growing and growing his power over time, even at the expense of assurances or prophecies or revelations earlier stated that he was going to, that his power and authority was going to be constricted. Is that fair or not fair? Um, well, I mean, I think it's fair. I think one of the things I always think about is that Joseph Smith realizes at some point um, wants to be at the top of the church. But I think at the beginning, he's trying to find a way to organize it in a way where, you know, it's everyone is, is, is at the, you know, kind of involved. And that's why you, you, we talked about last week with the priesthood. You, you have Joseph Smith constantly elevating himself when he's challenged. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't think he likes being in a box. I think he also as you see so often with people that become in power, whether it's in business, whether it's in politics, whether it's in religion, when they get power and they get followers and they get people who are just fawning over them and treat them as a divine figure. Uh, yeah, it goes to your head and it does alter the way you're going to interact. And it also, in a lot of ways will, um, let you maybe go on a road that you probably shouldn't go down because you now have people who are allowing you to do it. And so, yeah, it's hard to look at like the motivations of what Joseph was doing. I just think the fact that you could show that he's making those changes so that he is the only one who can do it to me is telling. And I also think one of the things about David Whitmer's response that keeps pointing it at Sidney Rigdon, one of the things that's interesting to me on that is I think as people, we constantly have this this need, if we believe in something, to always blame something else for it. And I think David Whitmer just doesn't want to say that Joseph Smith made it up. I think he wants to put the blame on someone else so that he doesn't have to accept the fact that he was part of something that was not what it was claimed to be. So I think there's a little bit of that too, where I think he's trying to find somewhere to shift that blame so that he can leave at least his experiences with Joseph Smith clean, even though the evidence and the history would tell us today that those have just as many problems as the later ones do. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next, uh, let's go on to the next slide. So this is going to be something we covered over the last two weeks, which is the priesthood restoration. And so this is what is now known today as DNC 20, DNC 27. So we covered this a lot last week. If you haven't listened to the priesthood restoration episode, I would highly recommend that. I think that's a very important one. But to cover it in a more shorter uh, way here, uh, when Joseph Smith orig originally published the restoration of the priesthood, there is absolutely no mention of John the Baptist, um, nor is there a mention of the Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, there's no mention of Peter, James, and John. And just as we've been talking about Sidney Rigdon a lot, these ideas did not come over until Sidney Rigdon joined the church as his branch uh, was the Campbellite branch. And they were talking about multiple priesthoods with a Aaronic and a Melchizedek priesthood. And so Rigdon comes over, he brings these ideas over. And as we talked about last week, um, the next year, Joseph Smith introduces the higher priesthood in 1831, which is the first time Joseph was ever ordained to it. Um, and then as the years go on, the story evolves into what we have as DNC 20 and 27, um, but really not until about 1835 because they did not mention the visitations by Peter, James, and John or John the Baptist until after, I believe, February of 1835 is the first time. So this is a story that takes six years to develop. And as we talked about last week, this, this is all about authority. This is all about retrofitting a story that was effectively started by Oliver and then finished by Joseph to put themselves above everybody else in the church. And obviously we went through all of this last week in greater detail, but this is a huge element to looking at the changes to the DNC. Yeah. And I, I think it's super significant just really, as I'm kind of observing this, not only do we know that the whole, and we talked about this, the Peter, James and John, John, the Baptist priesthood restoration, higher, lower priesthood that doesn't really fully evolve until 1835. Yep. I think it's so significant that we know the source of the introduction of those ideas, which is yeah. Sidney Rigdon. It's one thing for the church to claim, Oh, we didn't, you know, it, it was known in the minds of everyone. It was just never written down, but we actually know where the idea came from in this case. And I think that's, yes. that's really, that's to me, that's significant. Okay. Yeah. It's huge. And yeah. so, um, we, we talked about this last week. So this is, um, a change as we talked about a little bit last week, Joseph Smith makes a significant change, which elevates his authority in the church to be unmatched until 1835. Um, both Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were referred to as elders in the church. The Book of Commandments states the following. 
um, which commandments were given to Joseph, who was called of God and ordained an apostle of Jesus Christ, an elder of this church, and also to Oliver Cowdery, who was called of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and an elder of this church, and ordained under his hand. And now if you look at the DNC 20 entry, it says, which commandments were given to Joseph Smith Jr., who was called of God and ordained an apostle of Jesus Christ to be the first elder of the church, and to Oliver Cowdery, who was also called of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to be the second elder of this church and ordained under his hand. And so here, Joseph is basically stating, I'm the, the top gun, Oliver's you know, my, my second in command. And this all happens after Oliver Cowdery creates the angelic visitation in 1834. And because of that, Joseph makes him the number two um, later in the year, which then leads to all these changes in 1835. So as we detailed last week, this is something that is years in the making and is absolutely a significant change to make sure that their authority can no longer be questioned by the Missouri branch or anyone else who has a problem with the way Joseph Smith is running things. So in this one, it's it's Joseph becoming first elder, and Oliver becoming second elder. Yes, you, you, that that's a that's a significant change. Yeah, and it seems small, but it's huge. Yeah, because it's basically Joseph pulling rank, and what we what we see over time with, you know, humans, not just you know leaders of cults or high demand religions. It's that power gains over time. Whether you know Warren Jeffs is the perfect example of how he started out as just like the school teacher you know, in, in some bountiful school or, you know, Sandy school, but over time he, he gains all power possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in, in like, um, you could look at like David Crush, obviously, I, you know, watching the Waco series, you could see how all of a sudden people are starting to believe in him. And when they believe in him, he believes in himself more, yeah. but you can even look at things like business people. You have those stories of the last few years where uh, a business person or like a TV personality, yeah. you know, they kind of start small and then all of a sudden they get this big job and you've got these women in their department that maybe he feel they, that this man feels is making an interest in him. And all of a sudden he abuses his power. Yeah. You have this everywhere where people are constantly, the more power they get, the more they want and the more they're willing to abuse yeah. it. Not everyone, but it happens yeah. a lot. No, I mean, it, I think, it, I don't know who it was, Lord Acton or whoever who said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and George Orwell and animal farm and, and all that, uh, show and, and even Lord of the Rings, and the ring is just all about power corrupting, which is, it's true yeah. for all of us, not just Joseph, but it's certainly true it is. for Joseph. Well, I mean, you know, and, and the, the question I've always had with this stuff, especially after doing the deep dive is it's like, why did God have to give Joseph Smith this revelation? If it's just through a rock and a hat, why couldn't anybody grab a rock and have the words appear to say, yes, you know, yeah. I, God have um, made yeah. Joseph Smith Jr. My servant. Like, why is it always, yeah. um, put down like basically a pyramid, you know, you start at the top right. and then it goes, it funnels down. It's like, why, if, if God really is all powerful, yeah. why do we have to jump through hoops? Yeah. And, and that's something that why can't it be constantly... that every, why can't it be that this is a great point, Mike, why can't it be that every member who has faith and is obedient gets their own rock and everyone can simultaneously yeah. see what God wants. Why does it have to always filter through usually a white yep. male who just happens to want your, your wives <laughs> sometimes, you know well, what I mean? It's just like, well, it's like, Kind of, I mentioned last week about you know how the priesthood restoration is almost as if you know Joseph Smith is the 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 dad and he's telling his kids to do something. The kids are like, no, I, you know, you're not my dad or whatever. And he's like, yes, I am. You know, and then <laughs> creates revelation to be like, yeah, I'm the dude. Yeah. And it's the same thing here. It's like the church will will tell you God told me this specific thing, right? Whether it's like the November 15 policy, Russell and Nelson said this was revelation from God, and then they'll tell you. We'll go pray and have a good feeling about it. They're not going to tell you, go pray and God's going to give you those same words because yeah. it just doesn't happen. And it's the same thing here. It's like, why are we supposed to believe yeah. that God is so powerful? And yet also, I mean, not to, I, I'm not saying it, I'm saying it in the, the sense of the way the Mormon church works. He's so powerful that he can foresee everything that's going to happen from the beginning to the end. He can do everything. And yet also so weak that he can't give the same message to other people. And, and we're going to get to that more with polygamy where it's like, Joseph Smith's like, Hey, I got this revelation from God. I need to take another wife. And he told me you're the one Like he literally tells women, God told me you're the one you think God would just come to them and be like, Hey, just so you know, yeah. um, I need this new principle to be established and you're going to be the person yeah. because you've been faithful. It, it doesn't work that way. And that's, it always filters through Joseph. It always filters through Joseph. Yeah. And, and so these, these revelations are to make sure that nobody 
questions the fact yeah. that it always has to come through one and, person. And and we know in Mormonism that if the prophet says something and then you get an individual revelation that that's wrong, if you take that back to your leaders and say, hey, the Lord told me the prophet's wrong, that's not never going to fly. That's literally yeah. never going to fly. Yep. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just say um, is that I, I really like the quote we came up with last episode. You have to have a rank to pull rank. And yeah. this this scripture, particularly this scripture change, is an epi- is is an example of Joseph Smith needing to establish rank so that he can pull rank on Oliver later. Yeah, okay, it uh, is. so tell us about this next visual slide. I'm I'm assuming this comes from the Tanners again. This comes from the Tanners, and so this is um, DNC twenty on the left and DNC twenty seven on the right, and this is just a visual of all of the text that was added to the revelation that was claimed to have come directly from God, and so you could see. I mean, these are blocks of text and you can obviously on our website, we have these images. Uh, you can go to the Tanners and they have it um, as well. Since obviously I grabbed it from them and um, it just shows how these are not small. Like the leaders will tell you, oh, just small changes. These are massive additions to revelations that were claimed to have happened. In this case, you're talking six years from 1829 to 1835. Joseph Smith is going to make, I mean, really these changes are from 1833, but the point is, over six years from when the revelation was originally supposed to have happened, this is how much information Joseph Smith has to add to make the stories line up. And that's a huge red flag that these are not historical events. So we haven't gone into detail on all these changes that we see right now on the screen, right? We did last week okay, uh, with that, the priesthood okay, because a lot of this okay. is him saying, you know, now I bring to you my servants, uh, okay, you know, Peter, it. James, and John, stuff like that. So it, it, it's stuff we covered last week. But yeah, so okay. um, DNC 20 is establishing more of the first and second elder. 27, I believe, is where you've got the visitations and there were ordinations and all that. So got it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, see, it's all see there. See that yeah, previous episode. Yeah, so this to, will link to, into our previous one a lot. And okay. yeah, we show we, that. Those, we yeah, show we show those images there too. Okay, perfect, perfect. That makes sense. Yeah, that's an important visual. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to polygamy and plural marriage. This is a big one. Yeah, so this is a yeah. huge one because this is um, DNC 101 from the original Doctrine and Covenants, and this is not in the church today. And so this is a dr- dramatic change because it's removed. And um, Joseph Smith entered a revelation into DNC 101 that included the following statement. Inasmuch as this church has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman, but one husband, except in the case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. And I will note right off the bat, because I apologize throw this out there, Joseph did not write this. This was written while Joseph was gone, um, but it was written because the church was basically under fire because people... Um, had rumors about Joseph Smith having affairs with his followers. And in this case, this is right after um, he had had a sexual relationship with Fanny Alger. Um, Apologists want to claim that was his first polygamous wife. There is absolutely no way that happened, um, as we'll get into in the polygamy episodes, because he did not even claim ceiling keys at this point. Um, And so I just want to say, while Joseph Smith did not write this, he absolutely included it intentionally with Oliver Cowdery, because as we talked about, um, when Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery went to go do the DNC, they worked on it, they edited this together, so this would have been in there with his approval and the church had to remove it in 1876 because obviously this is not what the church was following and had to remove it because it completely contradicted DNC 132. Yeah. And I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. I don't see any more on this slide. No, it's like, just one. Like, like, as I understand it, what, when, when was DNC 101 removed from the Doctrine and Covenants? Do you know which version uh, of the Doctrine and Covenants? So it was removed in 1876. Right. And so for the majority of the time, I think I think this yeah. is super important. For the majority of the time that polygamy was practiced, 80%, I don't know, it was it was being practiced in counter to the written scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants, right. also secretly, also something that people lied about. And we've we've already talked about the fact that we would send missionaries to the UK, right. you know, to England and into Western Europe. They would ask, "Hey, we hear you Mormons are practicing polygamy," and missionaries who were polygamists themselves would show the Doctrine and Covenants. They would show them that polygamy is forbidden, and they would tell them that no polygamy was being practiced while they were practicing polygamy. Is that, am I right or am I wrong about that? Yeah, I mean, there are accounts of that where they would they would use the DNC as a way to say, see, we don't do that. And then they come over and most of the time they had no money, no food. And then they're left with the option of being married to an old dude 
or you know being on their own and um it's a horrific 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 yeah. um thing that happened and when we get into the polygamy episodes i yeah i mean that's th- those are gonna be tough for me because those those are the ones that still really anger me because they're uh you know we talk about abuses of power or at least joseph smith altering revelations to 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 grow his power i think when you get into polygamy that also shows how joseph smith uses the voice of god to establish his authority in some really, really, really bad ways. And again, we have documentation yeah. on that as well that shows yeah. how he was doing it. And um, it, it is, it's all about authority. It's all about, um, you know, authority gives you power, power gives you authority, all that stuff. And um, it's it's rough. And we'll dig into this more, but because it's relevant to this exact yeah. section, apologists, oh, yeah. apologists want, you know, the fact that Joseph Smith started his polygamy years before DNC 132, was was ever introduced without right. telling Emma, lying to Emma. Apologists want to say, well, back in 1831, he did get this revelation about, you know, Native Americans and missionaries to Native Americans and how, you know, if you're a missionary to the Native Americans, you're you're maybe you're allowed to take on a concubine or an extra wife or two. Yeah. And like while that's revolting and racist in and of itself, they want their cake and eat it too, because they want to be able to say Joseph Smith was receiving revelations about polygamy as early as 1831 to help justify the Fanny Alger affair. But at the same time, that doesn't make any sense when we know it was codified in both the Book of Commandments, I believe, but certainly the 1835 version of the Doctrine and Covenants that, um, you know, man should have one wife and one woman, but one husband. So it makes no sense that Joseph was receiving revelation from God in 1831, allowing for his polygamy and allowing for Fanny Alger in explicit contradiction with his written scripture. Am I wrong? No. I mean, when we get into DNC 132, we're going to do basically an entire episode on the creation of DNC 132 and the history behind it because of what you're saying and, and the timelines, you know, we talk about timelines a lot with the first vision, the priesthood, yeah. you can do the same thing with, with polygamy. And yeah, it's, I mean, the fact that they put this in in 1835, you know, I think in a lot of ways to me indicates that Joseph wasn't planning on doing any, any system of polygamy at this point. Um, but I also think he got to a point where for whatever motivation, I know from an apologetic standpoint, you would say God commanded it, but from, from a historical standpoint, something, you know, we talked earlier in this episode about how sometimes you start to believe your own, your own talking. And it could just be that he believed he could get away with it or he believed he could use the voice of God to get what he needed. Or maybe he even believed that that's what God wanted because that's what he wanted. Uh, you know, we can highlight some of those yeah. motivations when we get into those episodes. Cause there is some, some little hints of that in some of the writings he did to some of the women and some of the things he told them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's bad. It's, yeah. it's a, that, that whole yeah, all the polygamy stuff to me is just horrific, and it gets worse the deeper you get into it, which yeah. is why we typically don't hear much about it in church. Yeah, and then just to check back in with those four statements made by prophets, seers, and revelators, their statements that no significant changes were made deeply fail when it comes to the DNC. You know, the polygamy, the polygamy changes. Um, you know, with with DNC one hundred and one. I mean, that that's another explicit example of their deception or lying or ignorance. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, like I, yeah. when you read the way they, they taught about all of this stuff, it's, it's just, it's, they, they know better and they, they made a yeah. choice, you know, and yeah. we uh, talk, I've talked about this a lot lately on not really so much these episodes, but when I posted on Twitter about certain things that have happened in the church recently. And, you know, one of the things I keep saying is they made a choice. You Sometimes you make a choice and, for better or for worse, you you made a calculated decision. And in this case, the leaders of the church were making a choice to tell people there's nothing to see here. And the the, the simple fact is the evidence tells us we can see it clearly with our eyes. I mean, unless we can't yeah. read, uh, unless we're supposed to read these differently than they're written, which is another apologetic tactic, it, it's, it's just beyond obvious that these are, are significant changes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go on to, I think, Law of Consecration, right? Yep, so this is DNC 42, um, and this is one that's not like a massive change. I would say it's not as important as DNC 5, but in the Book of Commandments in Chapter 44, the saints are commanded to consecrate all of their properties to the church. And 
uh, going back to Sidney Rigdon, this was likely a revelation that was at least influenced by him um, as his Campbellite branch lived in a more, you know, communistic uh, communal order. And Joseph probably sought to adapt that concept as well, because again, Joseph uh, was, when Sidney Rigdon came in, he, he rose into the church extremely quickly. And a lot of his ideas, like the priesthood, were, were eventually uh, integrated. And so this isn't a very small but significant change because when he um, edits DNC 42, uh, which is this, the same revelation, he changes consecrate all to consecrate of, uh, which changes the meaning because all of a sudden it goes from, you know, giving everything you have to the church to consecrating of your property. So giving at least a portion of your property. And like I said, this was uh, a change that was made after the church was trying to run in that more communistic, socialistic manner. Yeah. And it failed. And, and Fawn Brody wrote that Joseph's enthusiasm for the United Order was always tempered by the fact that it was Rigdon's conception. So it, it, it's documented that Sidney Rigdon was influencing this. And the fact is, it just didn't work very good. Yeah, I think it was all, his 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 enthusiasm for United Order was probably also tempered by the fact that it failed miserably. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it failed. Or I think, yeah, the, the enthusiasm probably d gets tempered by the fact that it failed. And then you probably are looking over at Sidney Rigdon and going, you got to be kidding me. Why'd you bring, you know, why yeah. did you think this was going to work, you know? And uh but it, yeah, I mean, but you're right. It's a small change, but it's a it's a significant and meaningful change. And yeah. it isn't just a change of like a a spelling error or a correction yeah. or something that was in a previous manuscript. And then like, oh, whoops! In the printer's manuscript, it was right, but then in the typesetting, they got it wrong. No, the church wa the church walked away from United Order from yeah. Law of Consecration. And so they needed to make the change to, to change the change in direction that the church was yep. making. And that's why it's significant, right? Yeah, because United Order was saying, God wants you to give everything you have to the church. And then that failed. And so all of a sudden you have to change God's words because no longer is that part of what the church is doing. So otherwise you would go, why is God commanding us to give everything we have in here, but we're not actually practicing it? So yeah. this is another area where something changes and Joseph has to go back and change God's words yep. to make it work. Yep. And in this case, to Joseph's credit, I guess he's decreasing his power and money instead yeah, of increasing I mean, a bit. it. So good yeah, for Joseph. I, I guess that. sometimes when you have a big failure, you do have to, <laughs> you know, take a step back and, and go, you know, how do I, how you do know, I kind of regroup damage, and reform and go forward? Yeah, it's so the, that's I, true. So I'm assuming this is a Sandra Tanner visualization yes, this, of those changes. Yeah, so it's another Sandra Tanner and Gerald Tanner uh, production of the changes. It just shows, again, that these are not small changes. So, you know, you're going to have some in there if you look at it and you go, yeah, it's, that's no big deal. You know, it's just changing a little word or it's adding one word to make it a little bit more readable. But there are also within that very significant changes uh, that are, again, altering the word that is claimed to be given from God, either through the seer stone or later on uh, directly through Joseph through prayer. So either way, jo Joseph is claiming to be uh, relaying or dictating the exact words of God to a scribe. And yet, look at how much has to be changed yeah. just a few years later. Yeah, those are big changes, and we know why they made the yeah. changes. Yeah, that's just it. So we know why, and that's that's a big big deal. So okay, the next one is a sprout, a rod, or the gift of Aaron, DNC eight. Yeah, and so this one is an interesting one because one of the things we always talk about Joseph in his magical worldview and using the rock and a hat. Um, Oliver Cowdery was also a very magical worldview minded person, and he used what was called a, a dowsing rod, and so. That was his background was also in magic. And so um, they call it divining rod, a dowsing rod, water witching. And so this is a revelation that actually changes three times. So in the original commandment, it says, to, this is a revelation from God to Oliver Cowdery. It says, remember, this is thy gift now. This is not all for thou hast another gift, which is the gift of working with the sprout. That's the rod. Behold, it hath told you things. Behold, there is no other power save God that can cause the thing of nature to work in your hands. And just as a real quick thing. So when you believe in this, you're holding like this little rod. And um, so actually, can you show me real quick? Yeah. So you're holding like a little oh, rod. Yeah, go ahead. And we're going to pretend this popsicle stick is like a dousing <laughs> rod. And so you're, you're, you're praying or you're, you're asking, or uh, a lot of times when they're looking for water, they're walking over, over land and all of a sudden, it'll start going like this when you're over water or you'll pray and you say, um, you know, dear, uh, heavenly father, um, is it true that I should marry so-and-so? And then you, you hold it real steady. And all of a sudden, you know, that's yes. And it sounds, it looks stupid, but that's what they did. So that's a magical worldview. So that is 
what the water I'm, I'm sure people would say I'm, I'm, I'm give it kind of characterizing it, but yeah, the whole idea is you're holding it and God will answer by moving that for you. Um, and that's how, that's how Oliver believed he had a connection with the supernatural or the divine. And so this revelation is saying, uh, this thing of nature, uh, God is the only thing that can, can cause this thing of nature to work in your hands. He's saying, God's the only thing that is making this rod work. So this is another revelation from God saying that, yes, I absolutely am conducting folk magic on, on the earth, even though as we've shown in previous episodes, it doesn't actually work. So if we go back to the slide, um, that first revelation is the original revelation. And can I just they, say, never yeah. in the history of any of my time in the church did I, you know, in all the movies and all the film strips that the church created, you know, film strips, doot, doot, you know, or the movies that came later, all those cinematic productions that, that the church shows at Temple Square in the visitor center, never did I see Oliver Cowdery walking around with the sprout like looking for water, right? Yep. Or or anything. And there's a reason for that. It's yeah, because it's is. superstitious and kooky and weird. And it even though stupid. It was, even though a lot of people did it back then, it takes away from the credibility of yeah. the narrative in modern times. And that yeah. explains the changes you are about to tell us. <laughs> yeah, and th and that's why because they don't they want to get this stripped out. And so when they do the Book of Commandments in 1833, now remember in 1833, all of this treasure digging stuff is still following Joseph around. So of course you don't want to uh, be as folk magic. So in the Book of Commandments, they change the word sprout to the word rod. So instead of saying working with the sprout, it's working with the rod. And then it says, um, no other rod, power I say guess, is that because rod sounds a little bit better than sprout? I think so, because sprouts kind of like, you know, it just sounds like you're holding a stick. You know, I think Rod at least gives it maybe more of a <laughs> credible, more formal kind I mean, of thing. And, you know, I'm thinking, hold to the rod, the iron yeah, rod. I mean, like it sounds, yeah, it sounds I, better. I don't think that's it, but maybe. I mean, I yeah, I, just, I think it sounds better. I'm just saying think, it's scriptural. I don't know anything in the Bible that says, behold, grab your sprout. You know what I mean? No, but, I think, yeah, I think they just want to get that word out of there because it sounds so <laughs> folksy. And, and so they change that. And then um, it says, you know, no other power save God that can cause this rod of nature to work in your hands. So they're putting the word rod in there to try to make it a little bit more, I think, credible or at least a little less folk magic-y. But then when they change it in 1835, so they've gone from sprout to rod, and then they go from that to the gift of Aaron. And then later they say, no other power, but the uh, no save the power of God that can cause this gift of Aaron to be with you. And so they are absolutely now stripping all of the folk magic out. And now they're calling a basically a stick that's a, a water divining water witching stick uh the gift of Aaron which is which makes it to more make it, it gives it general more general applicability it can mean anything right and it takes it out of the weird folksy sprout thing into rod which is a little more biblical a little more solid sounding into yep. the gift of Aaron which really can mean have nothing to do with folk magic at all yeah right yeah exactly that's and that's just it they're trying to say Oliver was given a gift by God and they're going to call it the gift of Aaron so that when people read it, especially if you're a potential convert or even an outsider who has questions, you're going to read it and you're not going to think, oh, this guy was walking around with a stick, you know, or, you know, trying, because there's, um, we don't have it in here because it's not really a change, but, you know, at one point Oliver's like, hey, can I try translating the Book of Mormon? And Joseph's like, yeah, sure, go ahead and give it, see if you could do it. And then um, he tries to do it, and then he gets a revelation from God saying, you didn't, see, you didn't seek it out in your mind or study out in your mind, therefore you don't get to do it. And it's because, again, like Joseph Smith is claiming to read words off of a rock. Oliver Cowdery would probably be like thinking up a sentence and then holding out a stick going, okay, is that the right line? You know, it looks silly because it is silly. And, um, you know, I think that's one of those things where when you look at the folk magic origins of the church, it it's embarrassing. And that's why they're stripping it out of their scriptures. And that's why they strip, have stripped it out of their history so well. Because if, if you know, like I said, as a convert, if, if they'd come to me and said, had a picture of Joseph with his head in a hat, and Oliver with a stick on the side, I would just be like, this is nonsensical. And that's why they don't show it to you. And, and, and until recently, I would argue they don't even like, even in saints, they'll kind of, they kind of hit you with it a little bit, but they don't really, they, they still try to make it more of using the Nephi interpreters and the breastplate and Urim and Thummim and all of that, as we showed in the earlier episodes, it's all retrofitted language. Uh, that, well, Urim and Thummim is anyways. And um, yeah, so it's just, it's just an attempt to downplay the magical origins of the church. Yeah. Yep, because that's embarrassing. 
Uh, and it makes it seem more folk magic than actually scriptural. So there's a there's another slide. Yeah, so slide this, and we already kind of covered the the fact that the Urim and Thummim is a term that was 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 retrofitted later. It was not something they talked about early. And then there's just this quote. Uh, it's from Marvin Hill. He was an assistant professor of history at BYU, and he admitted that when Oliver Cowdery took up his duties as a scribe for Joseph Smith in 1829, he had a rod in his possession which Joseph Smith sanctioned. Um, he says some of the rodsmen or money diggers who moved into Mormonism were Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, Orrin Rockwell, Joseph and Newell Knight, and Josiah Stoll. And it's just worth noting that two of the three witnesses were known to be treasure diggers or money diggers or water witchers, uh, which means that they are absolutely believing in things that are just, as we know today, nonsensical. And it's really important to note that in the early church, a, a large element of the the early uh, founding members were from a worldview that I think today, if you told an, a member of the church, you explained it to him without saying who they were or that they were Mormons or the early Mormon witnesses, they would say, oh my goodness, those people are making it up. It's just, you know, it's, it's important to note that because the church has worked so hard to strip out all of the magical folk magic references to all of these early members of the church. Yeah. And like in the case of Michael Quinn, he comes out with the book, you know, more, Mormonism in the early early Mormonism, the magic worldview, and he gets excommunicated for it. So it's not yeah. it's not just that they tried to strip out all the folk magic and downplay it. Uh, they excommunicated people who talked about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that shows, you know, that's when the church starts to become cult-like, when it's suppressing information and punishing its truth tellers. So what's this? This is a, this is a lovely graphic that actually shows. What Oliver with the, yeah? So this is a witch. painting, and I don't know who did it. Cause I, I found it online at some point, and I don't know exactly where it or, originated. But this is effectively kind of an artist rendition of what uh, using a divining rod might be. So you find kind of like a stick that you feel is special, and you hold it, and then that stick will move if it's confirming what you're asking, or if you're on top, if you're looking for water, it would move when you're. Um, looking for water and stuff like that. And um, I, I know Dan Vogel talked about it once and he said a lot of them believed it because, you know, your body can, can when you're walking along looking for water, can make things move, you know, because uh, subconsciously you're you're in such a mode of, of looking for it. All of a sudden you, you notice a little movement in your hand that you don't even realize you did. Um, and and so that's kind of what Oliver Cowdery did. And then on the right is just the little bit of changes from the, you know, to to use the gift of Aaron instead of the the rod and just shows from the tanners again that these are changes being made to direct revelations from God. I think this practice, maybe you've already said this, is also called water witching. And I think yeah. that there are people today in 2022 who still believe in this and do it. I, yeah, think, I think you can are. still hire water witchers to yep. help you find wells on your land in Utah. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. think there are. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's very successful, but I think there are people that do it. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Adding in new church positions, DNC 20. Yeah, so we kind of highlighted this a little bit earlier with the priesthood restoration, but in DNC 20, not only are they starting to add in um, these visions to um, the priesthood restoration, but they're also changing the structure of the church. And so in the Book of Commandments, um, the heading of it is as follows. The Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ, given in Fayette, New York, June 1830. Two paragraphs have been added to it, having been thrust into the middle of it. Paragraphs 16 and 17 is the part added which speaks of high priests and other high offices um, that the church never knew of until almost two years after its beginning, as if God had made a mistake in the first organization of the church and left out these high important offices, which are all above an elder, and as if God had made a mistake and left these high offices out of that revelation when it was first given, oh, the weakness and blindness of man. That again is from David Whitmer um, in his address to all believers, which he's stating that you know they're throwing two paragraphs in there to effectively elevate Joseph to make sure he can't be challenged. So I'm looking on the next slide. Do you have the actual words that got added or changed visually? You know what? I don't actually. I think that was an area um, that I can read them. Oh, yeah. Re read them to us because I, I, I heard you read the text, but I don't think I have a clear sense. So it's, it's important that we know David Whitmer's complaining about what was added, but I don't think yeah. I totally know what, what was added. Uh, so let's see, it says like, no person is to be ordained to any office in this church where there is a regularly organized branch of the same without the vote of that church, but the presiding elders 
traveling bishops, high counselors, high priests, and elders okay. may have the privilege of ordaining where there is no branch. You know, I don't think that's actually. I'm gonna have to find it because I'm looking at the Tanner's thing. I need to to look up the. Well, it would make sense based on what we've talked about. Yeah, but it wouldn't say high priests. No, in, it in say. the in the there's no way it would say high priests in in the yeah. Book of Commandments because that evolves right, later. Right, that wouldn't be in there. And so, and so if 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 just high priests was not in the previous version and then it it it, it was in the later version, that would be enough for me to go. Oh, that makes total sense, given our discussion of the evolving priesthood. Um, and that's the type of thing that David Whitmer would complain about. Yeah. The, the one thing, um, the one thing I want to address is the church likes to do this game where a heading is not. It's not bad if like an introduction page or a heading is changed because that's not the actual scripture. Versus if it's like chapter verse changes. Do you want to address that because I think that's a typical apologetic. As far as like changing the headers, well, I mean the headers aren't. Well, in this case, written. it's an introduction, right, or the heading over the, the book of commandments. I believe the heading over the DNC was written long after Joseph Smith and was written by the church to explain kind of what it is. No, the heading over the book of commandments. Oh, this is from um, from what David Whitmer said, right? Yes. Yeah, so, f- yeah. So, I think what they're saying is what I'm um, saying is an apologist would go, "Oh, Joseph changed the heading." Over the Book of Commandments. Well, that's not scripture. Sure, yeah. So, so that's I think not what a big deal. I think what David Whitmer is saying that um, the the Book of Commandments is saying that it's the Articles and Covenants of the Church given in June of eighteen thirty, and then I think he's saying into the DNC now they're going to add two paragraphs oh, um, okay. speaking of high priests. And so he's saying, okay. what I think what he's trying to say is, look, the heading of the book of commandments is making very clear. These are the articles and covenants of the church. And yet Joseph Smith is still going to go in and change them years after the fact. I think that's what he's trying to to get at. Okay. Okay. So this next slide, a visual of the DNC 20 changes. Anything, yeah. anything you want to say about that? Uh, hang on one second. Sorry. I was looking back at DNC 20. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I was just looking uh, and you know, you've got some notes like um, in DNC 20, it says every president of the high priesthood or presiding elder, bishop, high counselor, and high priest is to be ordained by the direction of a high counselor general conference. Um, you know, I think they're, they're adding in these positions that were not there um, obviously in 1830 because we, we discussed there were no high, there was no high priesthood then. So I think what David Whitmer is saying is they're adding all of these things in and they're, you know, these are now higher than an elder. So it is an area uh, where you can see Joseph Smith is changing his theology on the priesthood. He's also being challenged by early members and he needs to restructure the church in a way that keeps him on top, delineates the priesthood so you can have people below him. And, you know, as we've been kind of going through this, we've been saying, one of the apologetics here in the church is that God reveals line by line, precept upon precept. And they would say that God just wanted to give this to him as he was ready for it. He couldn't give it to him all at once because it'd be too much. And I would just respond and say again, that going through last week's priesthood restoration episode, the most obvious, rational, logical conclusion is that Joseph Smith was the author of these revelations, had been changing what he was doing, being challenged by everybody around him, and he changed them, also the church was, them. Also, the church was growing, and when you have right. a growing organization, you need a more sophisticated leadership. Right. And what you would expect is that God would give the revelation ahead. Of, I mean, prophet, seer, revelator, seeing ahead of time, God could use the stone to give Joseph the correct organization that it would grow to in three or four right. or five years. But yep. instead, they just change the revelation as if God said it originally, and then they tell everyone no changes were ever made, when really what's clearly happening is the, the organization's growing, the offices and structures need to change, and so they're retrofitting original scripture, um, yeah, you know, or they're changing original scripture to modify it and then telling everyone it, it was always that way. It's, yeah. it's deceptive. Well, it is. And it, it, we, we talked last week in this church you're to believe that God knew Joseph was going to lose 116 pages and had a second set of plates created thousands of years earlier, preserved, protected, just so Joseph would have the exact information he would need to replace that text with. And yet God did not realize Joseph was going to be challenged and would need to have positions in the church that would make sure that people knew he was the highest authority. It, it, yeah. it is the inconsistency of the God in Mormonism that always seems to come out on the side of benefiting Joseph Smith or even in today, the leaders. And it is a red flag 
when the people who claim to be prophets, seers, and revelators claim all these revelations when you can't really show they're wrong, like say the lost 116 pages. And yet when you can show they're making changes and when they're being challenged, all of a sudden they're going to throw down you know, the, the revelation card in order to protect themselves while keeping everybody else you know, at arm's length so that they can't challenge them. Yeah, it's the it's the changes, it's the lack of foresight, it's the changes, and then the denial that any changes were ever made. Right. Right. And the punishing they, of people who mentioned the changes. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's that. Let's go on to uh, the parchment of John. This is one of my favorites. Yeah. So this is DNC seven, and this is our kind of our last example before we get into the apologetics. But this is a revelation where Joseph Smith is claiming to translate a lost parchment from John the beloved through his stone. So to this is happening during the book of Mormon translation, Oliver and Joseph are having a, a discussion, uh, maybe some disagreements um, about whether John, the beloved tarried in the flesh or died um, as a quick note. That is something that even the Joseph Smith's paper project um, notes in their historical introduction, that that was something being discussed heavily during their lifetime. This was a big question within the Bible, you know, with the religious community so they're trying to figure it out. And so Joseph claims to see the parchment. He's reading off of the literal parchment with the seer slash peep stone, um, which of course they're going to retrofit into the Urim and Thummim. And he translates the writing directly off the parchment. And the crazy thing is this tells you it is an extremely tight translation because he is reading a parchment and then giving the translation through the stone of what it says. And yet when he revises it, um, in 1835, the number of words in the revelation go from 143 to 252 words, which almost doubles the text. And this is obviously a huge problem because we're being told he's reading it directly off a of parchment. So how in the world is he almost doubling the length of the revelation if he had already translated it through the stone years earlier? Yeah. Yep. And that's such a weird idea at all that, that Joseph's like, oh, Oliver, I can see this parchment that's in this cave back in the Middle East somewhere. Yep. Now let me use my stone to tell me what it says. Like that 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 introduces a couple really significant problems that immediately destroy a couple critical apologetics. Number 1 is why were the plates ever needed at all if Joseph just could have looked into his stone and and produced the Book of Mormon. So so the fact that plates you know, John Larson even said this, that probably tens of thousands of people died to create and preserve the Book of Mormon, the golden plates for the Book of Mormon. And then we find out that Joseph didn't even need the plates to be able to produce the Book of Mormon. Why? Why? All that effort, yeah. why all the, all this etching and scratching into the gold, which we know never happened now, but why put people through all that when Joseph didn't even need it? And then you yeah. go to the, the Book of Abraham, like... Joseph didn't need the papyrus to, to create the, the book of Abraham if he had the power to do that with his peepstone. And so this idea of a catalyst theory where he needed the scrolls to inspire him to be able to produce the text of the book of Abraham. No, he didn't. The, yeah. the parchment of John shows that he could have just read the gosh darn stone. Yeah. So there was no need for any papyrus for him to be able to give a perfect translation of what would have been on the papyrus. But we know what was on the papyrus and the word Abraham, Abraham wasn't even there. And so right. th this is a really, in my view, probably an under discussed, but devastating um, response to two critical uh, apologetics made around the book of Mormon and the book of Abraham and probably other things I haven't even thought about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to me, and before we even get to the changes here, this one to me sticks out the most when I think of current day leadership, because Joseph Smith as a prophet here and revelator had a question about the Bible, went to God, asked the question, not only was he given the answer, but he was given a vision of a parchment where he could read the writings of John, who I think a lot of Bible scholars think was illiterate in the first place. That's not really irrelevant. And yet we have leaders today who get up at general conference and tell members not to even discuss Heavenly Mother because they know as much about it as we do. And I'm thinking to myself, so Joseph Smith could ask a, a fairly mundane question about the Bible and be shown a vision of a parchment sitting in a cave that's been undisturbed and apparently unfound since. And yet current day uh, prophets in the Mormon church 
tell us basically you're expecting too much if you think we can get just good answers. This shows that Joseph Smith was able to get answers to any small thing he wanted to in the quickest amount of time. And it just shows you not just the consistency of God in Mormonism, but the consistency of the leaders of Mormonism. And that again is a red flag because we're told that God is leading this church and is unchanging. And yet God seems to be giving answers to everything Joseph wants, including given visions of parchments that are written by somebody who a lot of Bible scholars believe could not have written. And then all of yeah. a sudden you have this and it just, it shows all of the problems, um, not just with the past foundational events, but I would argue with some of the current events as well um, with regards to the power or lack of power that yeah. some of the leaders have. Yeah. And it's so weird that in modern times, all of the all the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve are ordained and sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators. So they've kept the term seer, and we all knew what seer meant. It meant you could look into a stone right. and see things. So they've kept the title, but as far as we know, from Joseph to now, there's no other prophet, seer, or revelator that's actually done any seeing. So why did they preserve the title if they're yeah. not even going to use it? And yeah. we haven't even gotten to the change in DNC yeah, seven. We haven't gotten to the change. So let's this get, is a let's get this is a really now. important one because I don't know if we really covered this last week um, in the priesthood episode. I'm not positive. I may have forgotten to put this one in there. So this alteration among d- almost doubling the text, uh, Joseph Smith actually is going to retrofit the priesthood restoration into this parchment, and so um, he adds the following text. And I will make thee to minister for him and for my, thy brother James and unto you three, Peter, James, and John, I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. And this is fitting in to try to make the priesthood restoration visitation by Peter, James, and John and John the Baptist make sense. Um, because again, the story is not created until 1835 and Joseph Smith is going to retrofit it into DNC 27 as well. And like these changes are not isolated changes. They're all being done here because Joseph Smith is trying to find a way to make this um, consistent for his new ideas of the priesthood restoration. So So I get a little lost in all the words. Can you tell me what the exact change is between the old and the new version? This quote right here is completely added. This is not, this is just completely added to the initial. And I'm going to read, can I read it again? Yeah. And I will make thee to minister for him and for thy brother, James, and unto you three, Peter, James, and John, I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. So number one, we know that there was no Peter, James, and John in 1833. So we we can understand why that was added later. Yeah. But just that whole sentence wasn't there before. Yeah, not at all. That's a complete addition. That's not even a change. So that's just because you know, he almost doubles the text. And so he needs to add that in there because he needs to establish the fact that they have the keys of the priesthood to give to, to bestow to Joseph and, or, and Oliver. And so this is his way of trying to backfit that idea that they hold the keys and that they will give it to Joseph, which again is, is something he has not thought of in any way yeah. when this revelation was written down yeah. and now has to make it now wants to add it in there to give himself a little bit of extra oomph into his story of the priesthood restoration. Yeah. Cause it's one thing. It's one thing if, if he just claims that, Oh, I, I didn't mention Peter, James and John, but I was thinking it the whole time, but yeah. when he's, adding it to multiple places yep. in a, in a new version where in multiple places it wasn't in the previous version. Yeah. Well, then, you know, he's, he's making stuff up and adding it. Yeah. It's I mean, like, that's why a, you say it's a massive fingerprint. This is a massive fingerprint because he's yeah. reading off a parchment in a cave. And now all of a sudden, six, five years later, six years later, he's saying, Oh crap. I forgot on that parchment was yeah. also the sentence yeah. which totally backs up my new story about the priest yeah. restoration. And you go, yeah. no, there wasn't. No. Like, that's yeah. obscene. Yeah. I mean, just imagine, you know, that's like saying that this piece of paper I wrote and have preserved somewhere that nobody can get to magically includes more text six years later. That just happens to back up my new story. It's absurd. And, yeah. um, you know, we'll get to it at the, at the end of this episode. But this is the second um, revelation that Apostle Hugh Brown said was never changed. And again, he's lying. This is absolutely changed and in very significant ways. Yeah, so. that that really is a smoking gun. That's a yeah, that's that, a big deal. I can't believe I I didn't I don't know most of this stuff. So yeah, I didn't know about that one until later because you think of DNC twenty and twenty seven as the big changes, but this is also being changed in order to make that story work. So they're going through these in eighteen thirty five, and I think Joseph's like, you know what, we need to establish that um, line of the chain of custody of the priesthood to make sure that we can claim for sure that they have the keys to give to us. 
um, in the 1835, you know, claim story that is also retrofitted into that same DNC. Yeah. I, I, maybe you just said this, but it almost seems like that, that little verse belonged in the previous episode on the priesthood restoration. Yeah. I don't, I, you know what? I think I actually forgot to put that in there, which probably means I forgot to put that in the well, overview page. That's why we tell people to watch these in order. Yeah. We no, can, I mean, it's true. Cause this just is just like Joseph one. Smith. We reserve the right to change things in future episodes. Yep, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm going to go back in and we'll go back in and dub this in somewhere just so, so, uh, you know, we'll have the different clothes on and stuff. We'll just and, say, no, no, it was always there. And claim we never changed it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so now we move to responding to apologetics, and I'm predicting yes. I'm not going to love this part. Okay. Yeah, so this is um, one of the kind of ways that this is thought of. And so this is from uh, Joseph Smith, History of the Church, uh, edited by B.H. Uh, Roberts, and they say, Some of the early revelations were first published in the Book of Commandments in 1833, were revised by the prophet himself in the way of correcting errors made by the scribes and publishers, and some additional clauses were inserted to throw increased light upon the subjects treated in the revelation and paragraphs added to make the principles for instructions apply to officers, not in the church at the time. Some of the earlier revelations were given the additions of verses 65, 66 and 67. And I'm not sure what section that is, but I'm assuming it's one of the ones that talks about um, the different offices um, is an example. And so, what he's saying here is that a lot of the changes were made to correct errors by scribes and publishers. And again, this is um, kind of something we talked about with the Book of Mormon, where it's like Joseph Smith is claiming that the the Book of Mormon translation and would be the same for the revelations are coming off the rock in a hat. And unless they're written down correctly, they're not going to change. So you can't really have scribe errors by the scribes because of the fact that it would have meant that the rock would not have kept giving him the, the text that he needed. So I think that's a really bad apologetic. Yeah, and if I can just re if I can react to that, like number one, I'm a little sad to see this comes from B.H. Roberts because I think of him as one of the good guys, as being, um, you know, more of a truth teller than a deceiver. But he did have the role as apologist, so you know, I guess it it is a little bit on brand for him. But for him to lead with the 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 primary reason for the changes being correcting errors made by the scribes and publishers of of all the changes we've just shown what percentage have any evidence that the errors were were the scribes or the publishers yeah none none, none. so that's an outrageous I mean, and to put that first, like, let's just say there would have been a couple examples. I'm sure I believe that scribes and publishers make errors, but, but you wouldn't lead with the one with, with the one that has the least examples. And if it's yeah. somewhere between none and very few, then it's deceptive to lead with the least feasible, uh, apologetic answer. I think. Well, well I think too, when you talk about, you know, he'll say, well, a lot of them were done because like the officers are referring to weren't known at the time because they weren't created. Then you go, well, one, why weren't they created early yeah, on? Why, why? Exactly. But even, even more importantly than that, um, one of the things we've talked about in these episodes, it's not just that they were created, it's why they were created. They were created for a reason. And it wasn't just because the church was growing. It was because Joseph was being challenged. And we have documentation of literally uh, in the last episode where uh, Bishop Partridge gives him a hard time. He goes back and immediately creates um, the high office of the president of the high priesthood and writes into the revelation literally writes in there this a bishop is not equal to to this position to basically tell bishop partridge you are now under me stop questioning me so to say they weren't like uh officers weren't really known at the time well yeah there's some truth to that but you also then have to address why weren't they known and why were the changes made because we can show that those changes are being made through revelation in a way to um squash the um little bit of you know, kind of blowback he's getting from Missouri. Yeah. But then when you add to it, the fact that they don't, they don't tell you in subsequent DNCs what, what changes were made in footnotes or in, there's no effort to inform the reader that massive significant changes have been made, but then they go on to deny say publicly deny that any changes were made to not yep. inform people and then to punish people who actually talk about the changes being made. None of that lines up. It doesn't. None and that's, that it's just one of those things where it's like, I, one of the blog posts I have on the website, it's from um, elder Corbridge and it's uh, this talk he gave to BYU. And it's basically like, 
to say, focus on the four primary questions. And of course, the primary questions all basically circle back to the church is true. And he says, don't focus on the secondary questions. And the blog post was from a few years ago. I think it's called like, please don't look under the hood. And it's another one. This feels like that, where it's like, here's some, here's why they did it. Please don't look any deeper because if you open up the hood, you're going to see that the engine is not what we claim it to be. There's all sorts of parts that are not where they should be. And I just feel like a lot of times with apologetics, it's doing everything they can to keep you from opening the box. It's like, you know, you're, you're, you're walking up to the box and you're putting your hand on the lid and they're like, please don't open that. And they're just throwing everything they can to keep you from doing it. And I feel like this is another one of those areas where it's like, they'll give you the most basic watered down explanations without giving you the background as to why, to how. And, and the second you start to see that, then you see the patterns then you see why um, these changes were made. And once you see why the changes were made, it gives you a better understanding of what happened, but it obviously is not going to be faith promoting. Yeah, it's not faith promoting. And I think the church kind of over the years has had this position where you can pretty much do anything if 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 it's under the guise of wanting to promote faith, yep, even if I it's think totally dishonest. You know, well, I mean, it's like the whole lying for the Lord thing. I know yeah. it's a cliche, but there, there's a reason for it because there are people in the church throughout the history who have you know, outright lied. And, and sometimes because they feel like it's the right thing to do sometimes because yeah. they feel like they need to keep people faithful to the church. But regardless of the reason, they are lying. And in this case, B.H. Roberts is avoiding telling people that the significant changes are very important by kind of trying to throw a few examples where yeah. it might not seem so bad and it's just very misleading. Yeah, it is. Okay, what does Parley P. Pratt have to say about Joseph's revelatory process? So Parley P. Pratt said, after we had joined in prayer in the translating room, he dictated in our presence the following revelation. Each, excuse me, each sentence was uttered slowly and very distinctly and with a pause between each, sufficiently long for it to be recorded by an ordinary writer in long hand. This was the manner in which all of his written revelations were dictated and written. There was never an hesitation, reviewing, or reading back in order to keep the run of the subject. Neither did any of these communications undergo revisions, interlinings, or corrections. As he dictated them, so they stood, so far as I have witnessed, and I was present to witness the dictation of several communications of several pages each. And so this is basically describing the Book of Mormon translation, which is Joseph Smith is going to read like a phrase or a sentence pause to give time to, to, to read it or to write it down and then continue. The only little change you'd see here is that it, according to Parley P. Pratt, he's not asking the scribe to read it back to him as he continues. Um, but this is still a very tight translation and would give you very little room, I would argue, to blame the scribes, even though Parley P. Pratt saying the scribes didn't write it down um, or didn't read it back. You do have to also have to remember that Joseph Smith also was editing the 1833 Book of Commandments. So the changes between 1833 and 1835 are distinctly Joseph. Um, even if it was a scribal error, that would have been corrected in 1833 in the first place. So th this gives you a, a good in indication it's a tight translation. And I think it also gives you a good indication that these are um, early members telling us that the words of God were not revised. Yeah. Yeah, Parley P. Pratt. That's a name we should all recognize. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, Richard Bushman. Yep, and so this we referred to last week, but um, in Rough Stone Rolling, Richard Bushman said he revised his own revelations, adding new material and splicing one to another, altering the word wording as he saw fit. He felt authorized to expand the revelations as his understanding expanded. Joseph once said that Methodists have creeds, which a man must believe or be kicked out of the church. I want the liberty to believe as I please. It feels so good not to be trammeled. Revelation meant freedom to Joseph, freedom to expand his mind through time and space, seeking truth wherever it might be. The balance between freedom and control makes it difficult to keep Mormonism in focus. Was it author authoritarian or an, an anarchic? disciplined or unbound, the printed word of God constituted a doctrinal authority that at the same time was open-ended, allowing visionary freedom to Joseph's successors after his death. And yeah, yeah. And that's fine, Richard Bushman. The problem I have with that is that when we're growing up, when we're raised in Mormonism, when we convert to Mormonism, we're not taught, oh, DNC is scripture, um, but, you know, Joseph Smith changed it and, and altered it and uh, added things and took things away and completely removed things. And so, you know, this reflected Joseph Smith's best understanding at the time, but who knows, maybe he even got things wrong. 
you are just simply taught that it has always been this way. It is this way. It always will be this way. And Joseph communicated to us God's will. So, so the, the church wants it both ways. They want you to follow and obey the prophet unquestioningly and believe right. that Joseph got all his words from God without any problems. And Richard Bushman wants to tell us that Joseph wanted to be expansive, but, but if we're all taught when we're converting to the church or in the church that Joseph was basically constantly changing and editing and adding based on what he's seeing around him and literally reversing the meaning of prior versions, we're going to think about the scriptures very differently, right? Yeah. But, well, we, yeah, and but I, we don't. I think Richard Bushman's quote, I think to me, is making some sort of a inference that the revelations are Joseph's mind and that he's allowed to expand that with his, you know, change in ideas and, and, you know, being able to ponder it. But when you're taught, not just by the church, but by early leaders, by Joseph Smith, that these are revelations directly from God. And then you're also saying, well, Joseph felt like he was able to change him as his ideas change. I just, I feel like there's a disconnect there when you're saying these are the words of God, yet Joseph also felt like he was free to change him as he saw fit. Do you, are we really to believe that God is, is, you know, unchanging and at the same time, cool with somebody changing, you know, his very specific revelations as this particular person um, felt, you know, that, you know, was necessary at any given time. And I think that's, uh, I said it last week a lot, but it feels like you're now indistinguishable from fraud when you're saying these are both God's words and, you know, God's also cool if you change them. It just feels like such a big disconnect there. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. So that's when Richard Bushman pulls this stuff. I'm, I'm honestly, I know people love him. He's brilliant. We have a lot to be grateful to him for. And this is, this garbage is super disappointing. And it's, it's, it's why, it's why Fawn Brody to me or Dan Vogel are the legends and not Richard Bushman. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's frustrating. Cause I feel like he is doing this balance of trying to put a lot of information that a lot of members haven't read but also giving you ways to maintain faith. And, and in that regard, I don't blame him. The problem is I'm pretty sure that he'd be like an amazing person to just sit down and have dinner with and just go through some of these things and just get his thoughts on it. And I just, I cannot believe um, that you could kind of, and maybe I'm, maybe he would have a better way to explain it, but I just feel like there's that disconnect there by basically saying that these are revelations, but Joseph also felt like God's words were, you know, uh, perfectly okay to change as he saw fit. And I just, I feel like that is something that would never fly in general conference. If you said, Oh yeah, you know, um, God told me this, but I don't really like this part. So I'm going to change this, but it's okay. I, 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 there's no way that would ever happen. And so I feel like that's where there's this gap that you're just jumping from point A to point B without filling it in. And I think that's where I just can't get past it. Yeah. And what, what these apologists never do is just say, Hey, the church has misled us or deceived us or harmed us or withheld information. They will never actually take that extra step and hold the church leaders accountable for the things they've done. And that's why I consider them enablers, um, you know, because they enable the bad behavior without calling it to account. And I know why they do it, but I just think it's ethically problematic. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's someone, unethical. Someone so, that I, Blake Osler, um, not a fan, but let's let's talk about Blake Osler. Well, so now this in particular is referring more specifically to the Book of Mormon. Um, but I, I, you know, I just want to read it because I think it's kind of, core, uh, you know, carries over pretty well. So he says, the model of revelation I propose here is that of creative co-participation. It seems to me that the Book of Mormon makes most sense if seen as both a revelation to Joseph Smith and as Joseph's expansions of the text. This view requires a theology of revelation focusing on interpretation in, inherent in human experience. This view is grounded in two fundamental premises. One, or premises, one, there can be no revelation without human experience, and two, there can be no human experience without interpretation. According to this view, revelation is continuing, dynamic, and incomplete. It results from free human response to God. And so... Honestly, I think this is the way that apologists should go with Revelation, which is just to say that Joseph was a co-author of the Revelations with God. Um, I think it waters down the authority of those Revelations. Um, but this is effectively bringing with it all of the problems that a loose translation process has. And in a lot of ways, that's what Richard Bushman was just saying, is that the Revelations become a loose translation when Joseph Smith um, decides he wants to change them. 
And so I think this is probably the way they should go. I just think it also is extremely problematic and it's really pulls a lot of the authority out of the revelations, which is why they will never do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just think I, sometimes people have talked about Blake Osler's expansion model of revelation as being like profound. I think it's trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's trying to say that when you need an explanation, that's a tight translation of him reading, you know, really translating using, you know, as the word means with the stone in the hat, looking at the characters, you know, as if the plates were in the room and he was really doing the work of a translator, because that gives him power and that that makes him actually special and that's yeah. actually what the revelations about him said then we're going to have the tight translation theory plates in the room you know and Joseph having special powers but then when he gets it wrong which he does almost in every case almost with every single set of scripture that he ever engages with including the kinderhook plates which were a fraud whenever he gets it wrong then you need it to be loose um, you know, so that, so that you can explain away all the problems. Am I, is yeah. that fair or am I being unfair to Blake Osler? Well, I just, I think, yeah, I think the loose translation theory is one that comes out of necessity because there are problems that you cannot ignore and you can't just say it didn't happen. I mean, I, we did that in the book of Mormon a lot where we talked about yeah. the issues in the text and it's like, you cannot maintain the tight translation because the moment you do that, you're like, this is easily, you know, we could prove this false easily but then you fill it in by, you know, it's kind of the God in the gaps where it's saying, well, God gave him this revelation and Joseph was able to change it. So the errors uh, come from Joseph Smith's worldview. And God was okay with that because Joseph was putting it into a environment, to an environment that was familiar to him and to the people who joined the church. Um, but again, at that point, you're now indistinguishable from fraud because you're now saying that Joseph Smith was a co-author of the Book of Mormon. Uh, Michael Ash has a book that that is making that same case. And I think the moment you do that, you're making it out of a, out of a position of weakness because now you're saying the book cannot stand on its own as an ancient historical translation directly from God. So we need to put Joseph Smith in as a co-author because the heirs are now his and not God. It's kind of what I said earlier about how David Whitmer seems to blame Sidney Rigdon for the problems of the church because he doesn't want to blame Joseph Smith directly because that would implicate his own beliefs in the church being true. And I think that we see this here where it's like we don't want to put God under the bus uh, so we put Joseph Smith kind of under the bus by saying he uh, was a loose, it was a loose translation. So Joseph Smith's bringing in his own worldview that brings in anachronisms and stuff because that's how he understood it. So you're taking the problems away from God and saying, well, there's still an ancient core from God and the errors are from men, but that's what you're supposed to be avoiding by doing the translation. And so that's the whole value I, proposition of whole, having yeah, God and thing. a prophet is that you get the pure word. Yeah. Not adulterated. Now, n progressive Mormons are going to say we're we're holding scripture and prophets to too high a standard, but I I I think that's how I was taught it all worked. So I think that's on the church. So you actually have yeah. a slide where you respond to Osler's uh, theory. Yeah, and, give and again, in this particular one, Blake Osler was talking more about the Book of Mormon. I just wanted to include it because it is. Um, he was speaking about revelation and speaking about how revelation is processed and all that. So I feel, felt like it was a good fit and. You know, one of the things that I mention um, when I hear that Richard Bushman again was making a similar argument is just that a lot of these revelations tend to benefit Joseph Smith. So he has a revelation uh, from God condemning Martin because Martin doesn't want to give up more money for the Book of Mormon. And so then we have revelations from Joseph Smith when he's uh, proposing to women in polygamy that just happen to benefit him. Um, in the things he's looking for. We have the revelations about the 116 pages, which effectively give Joseph Smith out of a jam. We have the revelation where the waters are choppy and Joseph doesn't want to go on the waters because he's scared. And he and the other leaders that are with him get to take a train or something really fancy or carriage or whatever. And all of the people that are under him have to ride the waters that are, are horrible waters. And you just have a lot of revelations where you look at it and you go, man, these are awful convenient. And so to me... It, it, it feels like once you start granting him that ability to be a co-author, it feels like you could take a lot of privileges with that to then take it to the next level and go, you know what, if I'm a co-author, I'm going to get a little bit more for me. And I feel like that alone is the reason why you cannot go that way with revelation, because if it's the word of God, then you cannot allow it to be corrupted by a guy who has a history of, as we've shown in the treasure digging, we have evidence he was deceiving somebody who believed in him with treasure digging. Once you show he's willing to use intentional deception for that, 
And then you're also going to say he was a co-author of the Revelations or of the Book of Mormon. And you've already shown he's willing to use deception to better himself. It's really hard then to say that all of these errors are just something we can just kind of live with because it completely destroys the claims they're making. And it also almost always ends up being on the side of benefiting Joseph Smith. And I think those are things that are red flags, not things that are, you know, features of a, of a grand revelation ability. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Apologetics is pretty much always special pleading to explain, uh, you know, errors or problems or things that were hid from us or taught to us or, you know, failed expectations. And who's Blake Osler? Yeah. Who's Blake Osler to tell us how to look at scripture? He's just some lawyer who's a philosopher. Like, why should he have any authority over how we look at scripture? Well, you know, and I know people would say that about me. It's like, who are you to, to tell us what this means? And, and I guess my only point is, you know, Blake Osler has his opinions. I have my opinions. And I would just say that for me, the approach I take is to look at this stuff at face value and to say, what does the evidence, what does the surrounding evidence say? I'm not trying to make something like I'm not taking a, you know, trying to make a, a circle, whole fitness, square peg or whatever the phrase is. I'm just trying to say, what is it at face value? I'm not trying to redefine it. And so, but Mike, the a, the, I, I don't want to be mean or interrupt, but I, I don't, no. wanna, there's a difference because, because you're just observing the data and trying to come up with conclusions and it's fine for Blake to do that too. My point is it's a prophet seer and revelators job to tell us what scripture, you know, should and shouldn't mean and what's going on. And what you showed at the very beginning of this episode is that the prophet series of revelators aren't trying to explain away what revelation means or what translation means. They're simply telling us these are not the droids you're looking for. And right. there were never any changes to begin with. So it's, yeah. it's just the point that neither you nor Blake Osler have authority to tell us what scripture should or shouldn't mean that's the prophet yeah. series of revelators job. And they're either completely missing an action or they're literally explicitly and intentionally deceiving us. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, like that, I, that I said, I point. think, I think the fact that they should be able to get answers on this stuff and don't even try to give it to us, you know, you're not going to have Russell Nelson get up at general conference and even try to answer this stuff because you can't, I mean, the problem is, to There's answer no this answers. stuff in a way that is is logically consistent would completely undermine all of the authority of the church. And so yeah. you have to just sit there and just basically ignore the people like me who are pointing this out because you can't let members know uh, that it's there. And to try to explain it would just make yeah. it worse, I think. I think trying to explain it, as we've seen from apologetics, doesn't work because as soon as you have that second layer, they give the apologetics, you go, it doesn't work because of this, this, and this. And then and then it's it's just like it's screwed. And that's why – when we look yeah. at the uh, initial quotes and you go, that's just not true. And here's why Yeah, that's a problem that just doesn't go away. And here we've got Boyd K. Packer addressing these issues. So maybe he'll save us. Boyd K. Packer, yeah. please so save here's us. Boyd K. Packer. This is from the Enzyme in 1974. So it's not recent, but it's also, you know, in a, in a published magazine from the church. And he says, some have alleged that these books of revelation are false and they place in evidence changes that have occurred in the text of these scriptures since their original publication, they cite these changes of which there are many examples as though they themselves were announcing revelation as though they were the only ones that knew of them. Of course, there have been changes and corrections. Anyone who has done even limited research knows that when properly reviewed, such corrections become a testimony for not against the truth of the books. The prophet Joseph Smith was an unschooled farm boy. To read some of his early letters in the original shows him to be somewhat unpolished in spelling and grammar and in expression. That the revelations came through him in any form of literary refinement is nothing short of a miracle. That some perfecting should continue strengthens my respect for them. Now I add with emphasis that such changes have been basically minor refinements in grammar, expression, punctuation, and clarification. Nothing fundamental has been altered. That is That's another a whopper. That's a huge That's a whopper. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whopper. It's deceptive. Like they're going back to the Joseph Smith was a yokel, except when people joined the church in 1830, it's because he was a prophet, seer, revelator, and translator who had special powers to read into a seer stone to discern God's word for word, literal will, because he had translated from gold plates. So they want us to simultaneously 
hail him as the greatest human who's ever lived since Jesus, and they want to dismiss him as a yokel, uneducated farm boy. But that wasn't how he was sold to the world, and that's not no. what made you convert. Did you convert to the church because Joseph Smith was a dumb, uneducated yokel? Well, I mean, I won't lie to you. There is something to be said about I was told that story as a convert where they said, this guy had no education and he had produced the Book of Mormon. And then you read the Book of Mormon, not knowing that there were what tens or hundreds of thousands of grammatical changes to make it look as polished as it is. But when you read it, you're like, holy crap, this is actually a pretty good book for a, you know, a, well, at the time they made him sound younger than he was, what was he like 23 when he did it or whatever. But um, to, to write a book that actually reads as the Book of Mormon does today, if you're un uneducated is really impressive, except for the fact is the Book of Mormon doesn't read anything like, uh, the original Book of Mormon doesn't read anything like it does today. So yeah, it does kind of read like someone wrote it in a in a you know a woodsy area that doesn't have a lot of formal education. That being said, they like you said, it's like you have tight versus loose translation of the Book of Mormon, and then you have like brilliant versus dumb Joseph Smith, and you talk about how brilliant and gifted he was in some areas, and then when you have these other problems, you say, oh, he was, he was just an uneducated you know hick farm boy that could barely speak a coherent sentence, which we also know is not true. He wrote letters during this time that are using pretty, you know, flowery language. They're, they're well-written. I mean, I'm not saying he's writing like, you know, novels, but he could dictate a letter that read very well. And we have proof of that outside of the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. So it's just, it's a false equation. And this quote from Boyd K. Packer is in a nationally published magazine by the church. And he's, he's saying it as an ordained prophet, seer, and revelator. Yes. So here we have an apostle of the Mormon church writing in a national publication that these um, changes to the revelations, which people might hear about, is much to do about nothing. Then he's going to use what I would argue is kind of emotional manipulation to tell the members that not only are these changes not a problem, but they're actually going to strengthen your testimony. And then he's going to then use kind of that thought-stopping technique of trying to get people not to look further by saying, I add with emphasis that such changes have been basically minor refinements in grammar, expression, punctuation, clarification, nothing fundamental has been altered. This is a very manipulative, dishonest statement. He knows better and he's using his position of authority to make sure that members reading this nationwide, worldwide, don't look further because an apostle is telling you he's done the work and it's not there and he's lying, yeah. outright lying yeah. about what the changes are. Yeah, I would. Yeah, and I would say we've proven that number one, they were not basically minor refinements in grammar, expression, yeah. punctuation, clarification. And number two, they're not faith affirming. No, now, they're like, not. Like reading these changes does not bolster my, bolster my faith. It it adds to the mounting evidence that Joseph was making this up as he went along and that, yeah. that, that God was not revealing this stuff to him. He was just picking up influences from around him, making changes, and then backdating and, and changing things as he went along. So anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, Boy it's, K. It's, Packer, it's, shame on you, Boy K. Packer. Yeah, uh, you passed away, but shame on you for deceiving the members. Okay, so what's the the next slide? Yeah, so the next slide is just kind of, I guess, what we've already said, but it's like Boyd K. Packer is correct that the research shows there were changes, and it doesn't take a lot of research to find them, but is making a calculated lie that the changes are not fundamental. He's using weasel words to assure members there's nothing to worry about. And as I added, he's, I think he's being kind of emotionally manipulative to say it strengthens his testimony as a way to keep members from thinking it's a problem because it's like, well, if an apostle is strengthened by it, then surely I should be. Um, and then I want to revisit a quote from um, Hubie Brown, Apostle Hubie Brown, that I said at the beginning when he said, none of the earliest revelations of the church have been revised and the Doctrine and Covenants stands as printed, including sections five and seven. These two sections and some others are addressed directly to certain individuals, but there are lessons in them for all of us, and therefore they have not been deleted. And as we have shown, we went through both DNC 5 and DNC 7. This is an outright lie. Joseph Smith changed both of them in very, very big ways. And this is a claim you could make before Google made the information more available, because you could see this in a quick Google search. You can even see it just through the Joseph Smith paper project. This is just, it's an outright lie. And this is how early church members taught it and how it would have been taught to me even in the nineties when I joined the late nineties, because at that point it was very hard to find this information. And so the point is a lot of these early leaders, and I think the leaders today, they've all known better and they want to make sure the members don't because they know it's not faith promoting. And I don't know what more to say because I just, I feel like if we were on the other side, if I was, was lying about stuff like this in these episodes with you, people would rightfully call me out for lying. And these are people that claim to speak for God. They're ordained as apostles. And yet they are lying 
about very basic stuff yeah. because they don't want you to know. Yeah. Let's go to the Hubie Brown quote. Yep. So just to put a little bit of a cap on this. So not only have earlier re- revelations been revised, but DNC five and seven are both outlined above meaning earlier in the episode detailing just how much they were changed. Uh, not just in grammar, but changing the meanings of the parts of revelation DNC seven was, as we talked about, said to have been read off of a parchment in a cave and then was expanded to back up the priesthood restoration. And so DNC seven is a great example of how Joseph Smith claimed revelation from God to literally be able to answer any question such as them having a question about a Bible verse in John and being given a, a question almost in, or an answer almost instantly. You know, Joseph Smith could get a revelation on which young women in the, uh, in the church he was commanded to marry. Um, and yet today we can't get anything to clarify some of the problematic parts of the doctrine, such as why the book of Abraham doesn't match um, some of the anachronisms. You know, you think leaders could get answers to that. And it's just to note, wouldn't it be great if modern leaders could get revelations on why the book of Abraham translation is wrong, uh, why the church's scriptures say dark skin is a curse from God or who our heavenly mother is. And then to, you know, to look back at all these changes, even if they did claim these revelations, how long would it be until someone else down the road had to revise them? And I think that's the problem when you allow revisions to what you claim are God's word to stand and to defend that. It's like, then at that point, what change could be made down the road where you'd say, okay, that's too far. Yeah, yeah, and and this really does bring it home because it, it it ties back to kind of how we began, which is how we're sold either you know as children in the church or as converts to the church that the whole value proposition of the restoration is that God speaks to men through prophets and they can you know prophet means you know pro- prophesy about the future seer means you can see through a peepstone and and translate documents when you don't have an understanding of the language. Revelator means receive revelations, again, about the future or about God's doctrine. And so th- th- this is the value proposition. But but from Joseph Smith to now, well, during Joseph Smith's time, you get a bunch of revelations and prophecies and seerships that are problematic, that are racist, sexist, or, or you know, in some other way uh, disproven. And so, you know, there's some there's some stuff that people like, but there's also a lot of problematic stuff that had to be changed. And then since Joseph Smith to now, we're sustaining all these men as prophets, seers, and revelators, and all they're doing is basically undoing messes. They're undoing polygamy, they're undoing the the priesthood ban on on black black people, uh, the temple ban on on black people. And and they're not, more importantly, like you said, they're not ahead of the times telling us that slavery is bad, that slavery needs to be abolished. They're not telling us that women should vote. You know, women should be voting before the women's suffrage movement. They're not talking about the civil rights movement and how racism is evil and pernicious. It's, it's, it's promoting racism instead of denying, you know, denouncing it. Nothing about LGBT people and transgender people, nothing about, uh, you know, anything that could prevent calamities or wars or, you know, Problems that are causing starvation and suffering and 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 everything. Where are the prophets, seers, and revelators when we need them? Where are they? Yeah, well, and I think to what you were saying, you know, one of the our next episode is going to be on the Word of Wisdom, and actually, that's going to encompass a little bit of what you're saying, which is all of these revelations are absolutely confined to what Joseph Smith knew up until the moment he recorded them, and so that's why he had to go back and change because he's learning these new ideas that he likes. He has to go back and retrofit it so that it doesn't seem like he's changing God's decisions. You know, as we, as David Whitmer said, apparently God changes his mind a lot because he's changing all these revelations. But the word of wisdom is great because uh, Joseph Smith doesn't change it in 1835 because everything he knows up until then is basically the temperance movement. And it is very inconsistent and illogical from a nutritional standpoint. So the later leaders can't go back. They don't want to go back and alter the DNC um, because they are, I think, honestly, probably too afraid to alter God's words, or at least what they believe to be. And so they reinterpret it and completely reuse it differently than it's written. And I think it's kind of a good segue into that, because you're going to see how when you have these revelations, the leaders are now stuck with them. And now they're trying to reinterpret them for a modern time when we're taught in the church that these revelations are given so that we have direction for a modern time. In our time, And you yeah. just you twist yourself into a pretzel trying to make it work, which is what they're doing yeah. uh, when they're you know telling us on Sunday that we can't. Uh, can't drink uh, coffee, even though the word of wisdom says hot drinks, but you know, and we can't drink iced coffee. And it's just, it, it's a mess. And it's because all of these revelations are written 
only with the knowledge of what a, what any person would have in the 1830s and 40s. Yeah, and I'll just say to close before we hit the last slide, and I just mean this very sincerely, it's a hard world. There's a lot of pain and suffering and death and famine and disease and starvation and poverty and injustice. And I would love there to be prophets and revelators that talk to God that could help straighten things out. I really wish there was that. But what it seems to be that we have is we have, we're sustaining people as prophets and revelators when they're doing none of those things. And we're giving them our time and our money and our loyalty and our devotion and our lives and our children as if they really are uh, speaking for God and telling us God's will when really they're not. And they don't deserve that level of, you know, when we all stand up, when one of the apostles walks into the room and we all stand up to show them our respect, that they're not doing the things that prophets, seers, and revelators should be doing to deserve that level of respect and money and devotion and time. Um, but I wish they really were. I wish they really were speaking for God. So let's go ahead and conclude um, with this final slide. Yeah, so this is just um, kind of to put a little bit of an end to this, which is to say the recent episodes we've done um, are on church history, and they're in the same patterns we saw early on. So we have the issues with the Book of Mormon, with treasure digging, um, with the revelations on the lost 116 pages. And the simple fact is that Joseph Smith is changing his theology. He's constantly changing his views. He's constantly changing what he believes is kind of the way the church should be led. And these patterns go throughout all of these issues. And that's why we've said since the beginning to try to watch these in order if you can, just because they do, we do refer back to a lot of them just because these problems are not isolated. They, they compound on each other. Uh, there are common threads. And, you know, Joseph Smith started the concept of changing revelations, but the current church today continues this tradition. Um, and it tells us that either God is really confused and indecisive on what leaders are supposed to do and what we're supposed to do, or the people who claim to speak for God are making it up. And, you know, we saw that just recently with the November 15 policy of exclusion, and then three and a half years, God reversed it with another revelation. And the only real difference is that today, officially they'll call it policy as opposed to revelation. But in that instance, they did call it revelation. And we will get to that in a future episode. But it's just to state that, you know, the leaders today are still inconsistent. And as you said, they don't, they can't answer the questions that people have. They have these face-to-face -face meetings with the youth and they ask questions. And you would think these people as apostles would say, I prayed about it and God gave me the following statement. You don't see that today. And I don't know if it's because the leaders know they don't have that ability and they just don't feel confident making that kind of a, a statement or if it's because, um, you know, they just don't want to make a decision that can be upended by, you know, future knowledge in science or whatever, but they don't. And so for me, it's a big tell that Joseph Smith was able to pull revelations whenever he needed to and made changes as he needed to. And leaders since then are just basically silent when it comes to direct revelation from God. It's been 200 years um, almost since Joseph Smith. And we've had very few revelations that basically were just in the, the you know, the, well, I think the president, the prophet or two after him. And it's just basically been silent since. Yeah. And I think that's a, also a huge smoking gun. Why in the world did Joseph Smith receive 130 plus revelations during his lifetime? And yet pretty much none of the prophets since have released any revelations other than ones like the declarations to either undo polygamy or to undo the the priesthood right. ban. Um, not to mention the second declaration to undo polygamy because the first one was never even offered sincerely, right? Like, yeah, and, yeah. And the, the declaration to remove uh, the priesthood ban was not even a revelation. So, and we'll get to that in our episode right, in a few weeks right. on, on race and the priesthood. So, I mean, even those are more statements that are basically being signed off on by everybody. And so, you know, there's just, they don't canonize revelation. And I honestly think to a large degree, if you're a, you know, a leader in, in, in the, you know, basically in the last 20 years and you know the internet's out there, you know, there are always people watching what you're saying you are a lot more careful on promises you make or on yeah. um, predictions you make because you know that when the time comes and you're proven wrong, you're going to look foolish. And and we did not get into, um, we're going to have episodes on revelations down the road, but you know, we didn't, we're focused today just on the DNC, but there are revelations that Joseph Smith made that failed. There are revelations that Joseph Smith made um, that are just 
factually not correct. When we get into polygamy, we'll get into that. Word of wisdom, we'll get into that. And so there, are, the problems go beyond just the changes. And so the changes to me are important because it shows Joseph Smith was willing to effectively alter God's words to um, better, to at least put his um, personal or you know desires or needs at the forefront, whether it's establishing his authority, um, changing his theology um, with polygamy to get women to to basically throw away the moral compass, you know, by being told this isn't just me asking, this is God asking you. And, and I think it really shows how powerful revelations can be. But I think this episode also shows that these revelations are not what we're taught they are. And they're certainly not the direct word of God that we've always been taught they were. And once you start to realize that, once you realize how watered down the revel- revelatory process was for for Mormonism, and then last week, once you realize how watered down the priesthood authority is because that story was created long after the fact. All of these things start to water down and it's like a house of cards where everything's going to fall because once you realize the pattern, all of these things are not what they are claimed to be, um, it sucks and it's really difficult. And if you're a member watching this or if you're someone who's just recently starting to question, I feel for you because I was there, it sucks. And it sucks because you're going to feel alone because a lot of people that are are, are believing are not going to want to hear it or they're not going to um, accept where you're at or read what you've wanted, want them to read. I get all that. I was there. I still am there sometimes. And I just, all I can say is, um, as my family motto became, uh, over the last five or six years, not because of church, it, it, it's just, it is what it is. So, um, it sucks, but the evidence is there. You can't make that go away and claim it's faith because as I said earlier, you know, faith is the belief in what we can't see. These are things we can see. These are things we can show very well documented And as painful as they are, and as much as it just sucks, this is what it is. And so these episodes are not going to be fun if you're a believer, and I don't ever want people to think they will be, but I do hope that they are at least straightforward, and um, hopefully it helps you make more sense of it. Because for me, it took me a long time to get to a point where I could kind of make sense of it in a way that was more like chronological and um, orderly. So I hope it's helpful to people. It is. And so just to close out, I want to remind everyone that these essays can all be found at ldsdiscussions.com. In the show notes, we'll have a link to both the uh, Changes to the DNC essay uh, that that was the, the foundation for today's episode. We'll also have links to various episodes and resources that we discussed today, including David Whitmer's uh you know, the text to David Whitmer's pamphlet, which is really important. Also, just quickly to remind everyone, these episodes can be found on Anchor. They can be found on Spotify. And you can even watch the video on Spotify now, which is a nice addition. And you can also watch these on the YouTube LDS Discussions playlist. And of course, they're also available on Apple Apple Podcast app and hopefully wherever you consume your podcasts just in audio form. So Mike, you're the best. You're a legend. Thank you so much for today. I learned a lot and uh, I'm learning so much through the series. Thanks everybody. Like I said, I just, I hope they're helpful. I know sometimes I know I've gotten some emails where people are upset uh, because it is really jarring. And um, like I said, it, it is what it is, but at the same time, I really do believe that it will be one that will be helpful to people that really are at a point where they want to know, or, uh, people who are trying to find a way to make sense of it, that kind of, you know, like where I was, where you, you get to a point where you're like, this doesn't add up, but I can't quite piece it together. Um, so I just hope they're helpful. I hope they're not coming off as, you know, super antagonistic. It's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to put it in a way that's not sugarcoated, but also we're not, you know, um, trying to um, withhold any yeah. of the info. We're just putting out the info and, and, and let you do with it what you want. And I could just try and like never talk and like never give my reactions, but I'm literally reacting as someone who's raised Mormon, who's learning a lot of the stuff for the first time. And I'm both like saying, well, that's not what I was taught or I'm emotionally reacting. And I hope people aren't too off put by my emotional reactions because I am human and this is a human yeah. process. So, well, and, and, and you need someone to, to be able to, to respond to what I'm saying, because there are times when I'm going through it and I'm not thinking it from a certain perspective. And so if yeah. you ask a question or, you know, you're trying to clarify it, it's helpful. I think not just to me, but to others. And, you know, yeah. there are times too, I mean, I remember listening to podcasts from Mormon stories or Mormon expressions or, um, you know, infants on thrones, Mormon discussions, all of those when I was, especially when I was first going through it, I, I, I work, uh, my small business. I, a lot of times I'm working on my own, um, with, with some of the products we deal with and I would be, I would have my headphones on and I'd be like audibly gasping. Cause I was like, what, you know? And, um, 
and that still happens sometimes, not as much anymore. But yeah, I mean, it's people have reactions when you're hearing this stuff for the first time. It's just like you're like, are you kidding me? Like I had no idea, and um, and, and so I think it's a very natural reaction. It's just sometimes, like you said, it when you're a believer, you hear that and you're like, oh my goodness, they're piling on or they're being mean. It's like no, it's just it's a reaction because you're told, as we talked about in these last few episodes, especially because they're so foundational. When I was a convert, I am putting my life experience uh, against the way I've learned it actually happened. And so my experience in the church against what it really was. And yeah, that is going to elicit responses that are sh- very shocked because you trust and you you believe, especially if you're raised in the church and you're told from the time you're born, um, these primary stories and 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 these, um, you sing the songs and, and you watch the videos. I mean, this is a very ingrained foundational account you have. And then to find out that it's not at all what, what that's claimed to be is it's, it's, yeah. it's painful. It, it, it really, it sucks. And like I said earlier, and, and I know a lot of people go through it when you are going through it and you're in a family where the other people are still believers or your parents are believers or your, all of your community that if you live in Utah or maybe in Arizona or Idaho, and you've got a lot of people in your community that are built through the church, you can't talk to anyone. And sometimes when you do, you're ostracized or they look at you like you're, you know, I was told by missionaries that came by after I had started doing the deep dive, I think because I became a bit of a ward project and they told me that they could see the light going from my eyes. They said that Satan had got a hold of me. And I remember just being like, guys, I, I was going through it. I was showing them sorry, the, uh, the essays on the website. I'm like, guys, if Satan has a hold of me, then he also has a hold of the church because I'm reading it right off of the church's website. And and um, I just remember that they had like a very like surprised look in their eyes because they hadn't seen it either. And um, so it's painful. It sucks. And I feel for anyone that's going through this and is um, in a situation where they can't talk to people. And I hope that these episodes give you a chance to process the information in a way that's not hopefully going to make you angrier or at least gives you more perspective so that when you are ready to talk to people, um, you're able to do so in a calmer way. And I will say, and I know I'm rambling here, We really this is a bit beyond, the one piece of advice I would give to anybody who is first uncovering this stuff and you want to talk to people, your loved ones, your community. Um, the one piece of advice I would give is to take a lot of time before you talk to anyone. And the reason is you need time to process this in a way that you can talk to other people without getting emotional. And I made this mistake. A lot of people make this mistake. Take this information, let it sit with you, do some more research, talk to people online who are going through it too. And not in a way that's going to, make you angrier, but in a way that you can have actual conversations to process this. And then when you can have a conversation with someone without getting upset, without getting real emotional, then talk to people because they're going to be much more open to talking to you. If you can maintain a calm presence than they are, if you do like the thing where you just machine gun all of the issues out at them at once and you get emotional and I did it. So I'm telling you right now, it's the way that you don't want to go. And it's the way most people go. And I'm sorry to tag this on to the end of the show, but I hope for people that are watching this that are in that position, just give yourself patience, give yourself the permission to wait. It's not going to matter if you talk to your loved ones today or a week or a month from today um, to make sure you can process in a way that you can talk to them in a calm way to show them that you're willing to do it um, in a way that's data driven, um, that's not based on emotions and to show them that you've done your research and you're not coming to them after just reading one thing. And, and so it's a long winded thing to say at the end of the episode, but that's one thing I wish someone would have told me when I first started finding it. So hopefully it helps somebody out there who's just now going through all of this. Yep. It certainly will. All right, Mike, you're the best. Uh, Thanks everybody. And thanks everyone for joining us today on Mormon stories. Thanks for your support. We, your donations make all this possible. If you want to see this type of content continue, please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. We'll keep this content up for as long as there's support for it. Be kind to each other, be good to each other. Please share this with everyone so that they can learn and have informed consent as they engage Mormonism. We love your feedback. Feel free to email us, make comments on YouTube, make comments on Facebook, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. If you have ideas for other topics that you want Mike to cover or write essays about, we would love to hear that too. Um, and just, uh, be good to each other. Love you guys. And we'll see y'all again soon on another episode of Mormon stories podcast. Take care.